So we're going to talk about inflation and how to fight the rising prices. A lot of things in life, you can't control everything, but you can control some things. And so it's good to deal with the things you can control and not worry about the things you can't control. So we're going to talk about some things that are going up that we have seen and that we, um, we wanted to talk about because, you know, <laughs> this is a problem, but also there's also a perceived problem that isn't there. So we kind of wanted to hit both, both sides of it because yes, things are going up, but when you talk about how to deal with it, you have to actually get down to the nitty gritty and say, well, is this actually a problem? Okay. So. Well, and part of the reason why is when you hear that inflation is going up, uh, normally inflation goes up about 2% per year and that's considered to be okay. Um, because of the, with, with the type of economy we have, if there's no inflation at all, then um, it's considered to be a sign of bad economic activity. But the one thing that I would say, because I know where Tara is going with this, is some things the inflation is a lot higher and some things the inflation is lower. And so the average amount of inflation is for a whole bunch of things together and not for each individual thing. Yeah. So take it away. Okay. I don't have <laughs> links. So I know you said you sent them, but I don't have them. Um, do okay. In the editor email. Oh, editor. Okay. Um, let's start with rent. So according to Forbes, rent has gone up 3%. Now, rent has been and housing prices have just gone through the roof. I totally get that. We just bought a house that we were like, we can't believe we're paying this much money for this house. <laughs> but we really needed to move. And so even though rent is going up, a lot of them on, on average is about 3%. Now, I would say some places like Colorado, it's probably more like 10 to 15% maybe. Wyoming, I would say the same because people are moving there in mass quantities. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, look at alternatives in rent. First of all, have you cut everything back that you can? If you haven't, then you're just going to have to cut back. I mean, rent prices just go up all the time. And so are you going to have to move to a different neighborhood? You're not a tree. Move if you need to. You know, we say this all the time. And a lot of people say, well, you know, I just can't up and move. I, I'm on disability or I have kids or whatever. Well, don't just sit there and make excuses. Figure something out. Um, it may not always be the best solution, but it may have to be the best solution for what you can do now. You know, I mean, if you just can't afford an apartment by yourself, you may have to get a roommate. You may have to just rent a studio or, you know, those kinds of things. So you need to go ahead and um, figure out a different solution to your rent problem. And one thing about rent, when we talk about inflation, inflation is related to supply and demand. But the thing about rent is if you live in Colorado or in a lot of the places where people are moving, your price is going to be going up, but that's not the same as the national inflation that they're talking about. That's more of a supply and demand. A lot more people want to come to Colorado then there are houses. So the price goes up mm -hmm. because people bid against each other and that's what causes the price to go up. So inflation, when Tara said rents are up 3%, that means nationwide the average is 3%. Mm -hmm. But if you're in a place where everybody wants to go, then it would be higher for you. And that's why, Unfortunately. That's why Tara was saying a lot of times if you're really struggling with that, it, a good, it would be a good idea to move or to get a roommate or yep. uh, live in an RV. <laughs> or you may have to move to a different neighborhood or something like that. Um, hello, out of Goshen! We Hi, 
love you guys. Shame. All right, the next one. So jewelry and watches is up 7%. Was that the second one you're saying? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. All right, dear. What do you think about jewelry and watches going up 7%? Well, we were looking for some items and seeing which items were going up the most and which were not. And jewelry and watches was on the list. And I was thinking, so as jewelry and watches, um, it's good to know, I guess if you're an economist, that the prices are going up or if you want to buy that. But the reality is you don't have to buy those things. So if you're feeling like, wow, the price of jewelry and watches is going up, then don't buy it right now. And maybe later, someday, if, if, if inflation comes back down, <laughs> then buy it then. Um, or if you're in a market where you have a lot of cash and you're just going to buy jewelry and watches anyway, then it's probably irrelevant to you that the price has gone yeah. up. So you have to be realistic about these things. Like when we got married, our rings, our wedding rings, engagement ring came from a pawn shop. <gasps> I know. But I was like, you are not going into debt $3,000 back then to buy me an engagement ring. It's just not worth it. I said, I'll lose it in the first whatever couple of years. And sure enough, I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it was more than a couple of years, but I did end up losing it. And so, you know, I've had five wedding rings. They've all been cheap. Why? Because honestly, I think those kinds of things are just way overvalued, especially if you go into debt. And so... You've just really got to stop going into debt for ridiculous stuff like that. Yeah. Do you want to talk about cars? No. I want to talk about women's dresses. Oh, okay. Women's dresses. What do you think about women's dresses going up 8%, dear? Well, I like women's dresses. But if it's if it's pressing, if you're finding that you're, um, you're really struggling with your family budget and you can't afford to buy food or whatever is bothering you, then it might be good to not buy any new dresses for now. Or why do they have women's dresses on this? List? Well, apparently I was looking to see what things are the most concerning in terms of inflation. And these were this was the list of a lot of the things that they mentioned. And the thing about women's dresses is they're nice, but again, if you're willing to spend more on one, great. But if your budget is really tight and you buy a lot of clothes, then this would maybe be a good time to scale that back and not buy so many. Well, and I think that's kind of dumb because how many women wear dresses now anyway? My goodness. Five, ten percent, maybe. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. So part of the reason why I mentioned that on the list was because some of these guys' things are just ridiculous. You know, you've got to get it together <laughs> and put things in perspective and realize that some of these things that they're talking about, does it really matter? No, it doesn't. Um, the same with clothes going up. Stop buying new clothes. Buy your clothes at the thrift store. For all of our entire married life, most of my life, Everything has been bought at the thrift store. I mean, it's very rare that we even buy anything new. I mean, now I have to buy the boys' shoes new, but only because their feet have gotten so big that I can't find their feet, <laughs> their shoes at the thrift store. But there were, I mean, for probably 20 plus years, at least 20, more than 20 years, probably 22, 23 years. I spent $25 on the entire family clothes for the entire year, not the month, the year. Why? Because I would buy everything at thrift stores and garage sales and including shoes. And Mike would get a brand new pair of shoes for his birthday. But other than that, um, everything was bought at the thrift store. We couldn't afford to buy new, so we didn't. True. Although one thing I would say about things like the women's dresses, it's up 8%. That means that, so the inflation rate is how much more it is today than it was on the same day last year. So if you buy one dress, if you want to buy one dress for something, is 8% increase going to break you? Probably not. 
But if you are in the habit of buying a lot of them, that's the issue. And like with Tara, what she was saying, for us, as far as the clothes, we've been able to get really nice clothes at thrift stores. And I think when the economy, when the prices go up on other things, more people will shop at the thrift stores also, but still the prices are dramatically lower. So the thing is you can control, this is one thing you can control where you can basically have clothes that look just as nice if you shop a little harder, which is to say you have to go in and look for five or seven minutes. So Renee says women's dresses are probably on the list for women who need them for work. It's not always easy to find them in good shape or used for a discount. That is just not true. Nope, I'm sorry. But, but you're not going to give me that. Require a dress or just nicer clothes? Well, some of them might for some things, but to say that you can't find clothes at the thrift store or garage sale, that's just that's not true. It's just not true. And I'm sorry. I hate to, hate to be blunt, but I'm not going to let lies be coming through on my channel and that's one that is frequently frequently promoted in saving money is that good quality can't be found. No. You can. You can find really good quality and really good used clothes at the thrift stores and garage sales all the time. You may have to go to a different neighborhood. In my case, you may have to go to a different state so that when I go to Colorado, I will hit the thrift store to find those good clothes because we don't have them here in Wyoming. And so when I go to Colorado, Every time I go and hit the thrift store because I know that I can get them there. And so now you do have to be careful with thrift stores, though, because some of their prices are almost as high as new now. So be really careful that your thrift store, like the one particular thrift store we like in Colorado, we try to only go when it's 50 percent day and that type of thing. So know your prices and know that it's actually a good deal before you buy it. Yeah. Actually, it's funny because Larry Ware said, even if we were wealthy, we'd still buy used outlets. It's just so much fun to save the yeah. money. And actually, that's funny because even when times have been good, we still we still buy pretty much all of our clothes used. Yeah. I mean, we buy... like you buy Occasionally, new I'll get Mike polos. It's kind of hard to find polos for him. But well, really... I mean, underwear and socks, we buy those new. New. But that's pretty much it. Yeah. And so this is a great way to save right now when prices are going up. If you're used to buying mm -hmm. new stuff all the time, you can, if you buy, start buying some used stuff, that alone would probably offset the inflation that you yeah. would be experiencing in other, because like on some things you can't really control the inflation or, yeah. and you still need to use those things. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Next, we are talking about furniture and bedding increased 13%. Now, I totally agree. I mean, I think they have. Mike and I just bought another new bed trying to find one that we could sleep on. And <laughs> it was ridiculously expensive. And we're thinking about returning it because it's just not comfortable. But as we were looking, we were like, wow, yeah, this is really expensive. But we're sleeping so badly right now that we thought, well, we've just got to do something. But we did buy a new bed, but almost all the other furniture in my house is all used. Well, and all we bought for the bed was the mattress. Yeah, we didn't even get the box spring. Because Well, we have a base that we had gotten with a different bed that's a firm base. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't really need that. So... Why spend more buying the part that you don't need? Yeah. So Facebook Marketplace, when we moved, we sold. We didn't sell everything. I could have gotten rid of more, but I wasn't sure what the garage sell uh, thrift store market was going to be like here. And so I could have gotten rid of more. But everything else, we bought used. All our end tables are used. The dressers, Jack's bed kitchen tables, desks, all of those. I probably have not spent more than about, man, $100, $150 to replace all the furniture we sold in Colorado. And so then I sold it in Colorado and um, basically paid for it here. So it basically cost me zero because I sold it in Colorado and just turned around and rebought it here. So um 
stop thinking you have to buy new to get quality. That that word just drives me bonkers when people say, well, you have to buy quality. Well, I'm sorry. Quality is not what it used to be. And I got him as a test lands in polos to see if quality would last longer. It didn't, didn't last any longer, but the shirts were four, five times the price. And so, you know, stop thinking that you have to have quality in your house to make it last. I've never understood why you buy a, a sofa or whatever for $200 off of Facebook marketplace or a thrift store or something instead of spending $1,000 or $1,500 on a sofa brand new and people are like, well, you have to have quality, all that. Well, you can get used, really nice used stuff all the time. People move all the time and they've used their couch for six months to a year and it's still got a lot of time left. You could buy 10 more couches with for the price of one. Yeah, we've tended to buy things that were actually pretty nice and the people that bought them before us probably spent a fortune on them but when they were done with it they went to get something else maybe because they moved or maybe just because they didn't like it because a lot of people just buy new stuff all the time because they want to yeah and so if you could spend two hundred dollars instead of a thousand dollars on the couch that's awesome especially if you have kids or dogs or because what we found is we didn't like to buy new a lot of those furniture pieces because the kids would destroy them when we were little. Like they would jump on them mm. or do flips on them. But wait, some of them still do that. <laughs> I did not allow them. Let me tell you, they got in trouble for doing it. They but... got in trouble for doing it, but they still did. And the same thing, like our dog was a floor dog. Like, well, no, I guess we let him get up. Well, he was on the couch until he, he was couldn't. On the yeah. yeah, that's true. Um, but if you have pets and you buy quality for a thousand dollars on your couch, they're going to, they're going to mess it up. They're going to stain it and they're mm -hmm. going to chew on it and they're going to do all kinds of things. And so you might as well get the nice one, but for a lot less money. Yeah. And that's one thing when Tara Tar talks about shopping at thrift stores and garage sales and things, we don't just walk in and buy some gnarly, disgusting piece of junk. She goes in the thrift store and looks around a little bit and says, oh, this looks pretty nice. Uh, wow, it's got a, it's got this little mark on it on the back mm -hmm. where it's going to be up against the wall anyway or something. But everything else looks totally pristine. A lot of times there's not even a mark on it at all. And with yeah. clothes, she always the clothes she brings from the thrift store pretty much look brand new. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I figure if they've made it to the thrift store looking brand new, then they're going to last me quite a while. And they usually do. And if you imagine the thrift store where it's like really ratty clothes that you would normally throw away, I don't think a lot of thrift stores have those. But if you go to one and that's what's there, then go to somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so um, mom and I are going to touch on this a little bit when it stops snowing and she gets over here. But <laughs> but th this comment came up and I wanted to address it. I will not buy bras or underwear, socks, bathing suits, or shoes at thrift unless they are new or with tax. Listen, when things get really hard, you may have to buy those things at the thrift store. That's why God invented bleach. And I know that just seems awful and gross, but if it gets to the point where we're really having serious economic issues because right now we're not having serious economic issues i hate to tell you it's been a lot worse but if we get to the point where we have serious economic issues your your attitude is going to be what determines if you have a good life or you don't and you can't yeah heather says boil the clothes you can boil the clothes you can bleach them you can lysol them you can do all kinds of things, but it may get to the point where you have to use someone else's underwear. And I know that seems like, oh, Tara, that's awful. But it's that kind of attitude that makes or breaks people. And you should say, well, I'll never buy used furniture because of bed bugs. Well, listen, 
you can take care of bed bugs very easily if they're on there, but you can look and see if bed bugs are in furniture, you can see them crawling around. You can see the droppings. You can look and see if a piece of furniture is pretty clean, you'll know that it's probably okay. And I totally, I know that whole bed bug thing is just totally blown out of proportion now. You know, put it in the garage, put a tarp over it, set off a couple of bug bombs and let it sit under there for a few days and then clean it and it's fine. I have bought used furniture for more than 30 years now. I've been on my own for 30 years now. And I have never once had an issue with bed bugs or anything like that. Never once. And so you need to stop making excuses for things like that. When you need something, you do not need to go into debt to buy it when you could buy used just fine. So, you know, you can steam clean them, you can do lots of things to help with that. But um, that kind of attitude is what's gonna really sink people, really well, sink people. One thing to, though, as Tara is saying that, it just depends on the situation that you're in and how, how difficult your situation is. Like right now, there's really not that. It's not that bad. We, I mean, we we aren't going out buying used underwear. <laughs> no. But the thing is, we do recognize you can just boil it or bleach it in a minute. I mean, it it wouldn't be new, but it wouldn't be like disgusting. Contaminated, contaminated. Either. But the thing is, we wouldn't do that now because it's something that we would rather not, and we can afford to not do that right now. But like somebody said, they would never buy used beds. And I know everybody's worried about bed bugs and all. We don't buy used beds right now either. But we have because we had no money. We were in a desperate situation and we just needed a bed. And you know what? Think about this. How many people say, well, I would never buy used underwear. Yet they let their dog that's just been out eating poop kiss them on the lips. Seriously? I mean, that's just nasty. So... People, you've got to get some perspective here, you know, and I'm not saying go out and buy used underwear right now, but I'm just saying there may come a time when it gets bad enough that you may have to. All right, next one. Well, and one thing about that is right now, the reason why Tara says that is because a lot of people are worried um, that there could be something really huge coming and the economy could be going down a lot and, and maybe it is, but right now it's not there. So you have to kind of decide in the situation you're in, what can I afford? And am I like, it, it, particularly if you're saying, wow, I, I can't pay my, my major bills because of the inflation, then you need, then it's a good time to rethink. Somebody said, this is a great, a, a great time to be rethinking all of your wants versus needs. And that is one thing people get upset a lot of times with inflation because when they go to Wendy's where there are 42 cards in line, mm -hmm. The value meal has gone up, but they aren't as worried about, you know, how to pay the rent. Uh, like a lot of times people are more concerned about the things that they want and not the things they need. And yeah. so when there's a struggle and the things they need are going to squeeze the things they want, then they're upset. Well, and people get all upset about a used bed. You go to a hotel and stay on used sheets and use mattresses all the time and you think nothing about it. I never thought about that, but you're right. My goodness, I would hate to take take a black light at a hotel <laughs> and see say, what's on everything. <laughs> you know, and yeah. So, okay, electricity up 6%. Listen. You may have to turn down your air conditioning or turn up your air conditioning and turn down your heater. Right now, every morning when we wake up, our upstairs is 63 degrees because we have we have two heaters in our house, but we only turn on the bottom one because it's gas and a whole lot cheaper. So it doesn't come up as much. And that's set on 68, but it doesn't keep the whole house 68. So you may have to turn your heat down. So you may have to go into the 60s for your heat and you may have to go into the high 70s for your air conditioning. This isn't gonna be all 
what? Champagne and roses. You're going to have to make some changes to your life to be able to afford these jumps in prices. And again, it's this just is the way it is. Again, this does depend on what, what your situation is. Like if the jump in price is making it difficult for you to pay your bills, then you're really going to need to take a much more serious look. But even if you're paying your bills okay now, at the moment, there's no indication of when the increases will stop or when it will kind of roll back. And so based on that, it's good to be prepared now and kind of figure out what things do you really not need to spend money on as much or what things can you do instead to save it now. And then if prices continue, if inflation continues to go up, you'll be less likely to suffer for that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Next one. Robin says, believing things are beneath you causes people to go further and further into debt. That's yeah. so, so true. That's so true. And it's this stuck up middle class mentality is what I call it. <laughs> that, well, this is the only way it can be this way, you know, well, you may have to make some changes. I think it's funny because I remember when we were super, Robert Kiyosaki says you shouldn't say broke or poor, you should say broke. Anyway, when we didn't have any money. We were poor. We we lived in a little I town. I remember we, we were, were throwing, poor. a lot of you've heard this story before, but we were throwing some stuff away in the town dumpsters outside of town and we saw some brand new garden um it wasn't mulch it was perlite in bags that were sealed <laughs> we're like wait should we not take this out i mean what's wrong with taking it out of here so after a while we started finding a lot of new almost new things and some things that were used like books and things like that and we're like what's, there's nothing wrong with that and it was funny because people was the, in speaking to that thing about um about people having that attitude there were a lot of people who said, oh, I can't believe you take stuff out of the dumpsters over there. But then on our garage sale day, they came and bought those very same things from us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're like. Yeah. So our first our first baby, we didn't have any money at all. And we got a rocker out of the dumpster that somebody threw in there, almost brand new. And it had lost one screw. We put the screw in there, used it for two babies for two years. And then we turned around and sold it for $40. Yeah. You know, we did tons of stuff like that, getting stuff out of the dumpster all the time. I am not ashamed to jump into a dumpster at any time. I mean, and I don't do it illegally, but if if a dumpster is there for the taking, I will be happy to jump in and grab what I, <laughs> grab and, what I want. And even at our lowest, poorest, we, we weren't at the point where we would get food. Like some people do that. That's that's their thing. I don't say do it or don't. I do probably it. would. I think if you're a, starving, yeah. that would. Yeah, but even if you weren't starving, the grocery stores throw away perfectly good food all the well, time. Well, if they're in cans, they're sealed and stuff. Yeah, uh, but the thing I'm saying is, uh, well, yeah, there's other stuff too, and it does depend on your circumstance. Like if I was super desperate, my standard for what I would take out of there would go down. Yeah, <laughs> and that was. And I think that's the main thing. It's funny because a lot of people like Suzanne are saying, never say never, you may be humbled one day. Yeah, there yeah. are things where the right kind of difficult situation would be that. And, and the thing about inflation is it happens sometimes, uh, but when it goes crazy and they can't figure out how to stop it, right now I think that they are trying certain things that they think will stop it, but they don't really know. Um, if it gets really, really bad and it goes to somewhere like Venezuela or Turkey or somewhere else, then um, then you really kind of have to do, you'd be seriously roughing it. Like in Lebanon, they turn off the power most of the day. You might have power uh, like an hour or two a day maximum. And people don't really have a concept that maybe the water might only run a little bit or not at all. Mm -hmm. And that's in a really bad case. And at the moment, it doesn't look like we're there or going there, but it could become that. Well, I mean, some people think we're going there now, and and if they didn't get under control, it could eventually be that way. But even at the moment, it's mostly pinching your budget, and it, and you need to figure out what do you do about that. Yeah. And what we're saying is you can do a lot of things to improvise or change your habits in ways to save more money than the cost of inflation. And so you'll actually be living better for less money. 
that's yeah. that's kind of the goal is for us to help you understand how to live better for less money. Because there there've been a lot of times where we we've lived in neighborhoods where we all lived at the same apparent standard of living, but we made half the amount of money as everybody else. I'm not saying that, I mean, not that it wasn't always that way, but what I'm saying is certain times we discovered that. And the main difference is things like I only buy new clothes or and you buy thrift new store cars. clothes or we buy only new cars and you buy used cars. But the thing is like half of your income is going to, or more for a lot of people is going to things that you don't really need to spend money on. Like they're not really adding the joy to your life that you think they are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you can really get a grip on understanding what things are really, really important to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, fruits and vegetables up 5%. Yeah. Well, you know, 5%. Okay. So your zucchini is a dollar five instead of a dollar now. Okay. Yeah. That's a jump, but that's not really that big of a jump. So if you are complaining about the food prices being exorbitant, you know, you may have to uh oh <laughs> moving the computer so that the table is clear. I'm having a moment. <laughs> you can say it. Denise isn't on, but she's been waiting for you to say it. <laughs> You're going to have to get it together and change the way you're spending at the grocery store. Wow, that was the kinder, gentler Tara. <laughs> I thought she was going to hit the table, but... Oh. Get it together, people! There Listen, I am so tired of people complaining about grocery prices. Yes, they have gone up, but they are not exorbitant. This isn't Venezuela. This isn't Turkey. This isn't Lebanon yet. Are we going there? Yeah, I really think we're headed that direction. But it's not happening right now. And how many people have no problem going and spending money on booze and think nothing of going and buying beer and wine? But then they go and complain about the rising food prices. You're going to have to get a grip. And I have had person after person after person say, oh, food prices are just out of this world. They're up, but they're not out of this world yet. And so you need to get a grip <laughs> and realize you may not be able to eat your same Oreos that you love, you may have to do without the Oreos or get an off brand or wait until they're on sale. You know, let's talk about meat, poultry, fish, and eggs are up 12%. Okay, once again, 12%. That means that your that your chicken that used to be $1.99 a pound is now $2.20 a pound. Okay, that's expensive. But that only amounts to about two to three dollars a month in price increase. And yet you're sitting here sipping your wine, whining about how you can't afford food prices. Do you have anything to say? Well, I was just going to say. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm sorry. This just really ticks me off <laughs> because I have actually grown up in true poverty. Mom raised two teenagers on $500 a month. At one point we were spending $7 a week for groceries. Are you ducking? <laughs> Scratching my nose. I don't want to do it on camera. I have no patience with people who are whining and say, Oh, my groceries are $1,500 this month. That's me and my husband, and I just don't know how we're going to make it. $1,500 for two people? You need uh, our book. <laughs> because... You need to take part of that $1,500 and buy dining on a dine and learn how to cook and save money on your grocery bill. Yeah, because for two people. 25% off right now. 
because for two people, <laughs> yeah, there should be that. That's ridiculously absorbent. And if you have tons of money and you want to spend it, go ahead. But wow, if you're if you're concerned about your budget at all, you can save a ton of money. Yeah, you retire early. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, our grocery bill has stayed the same. It has not gone up yet. Now, I know it's like Mike said. He said for fifteen hundred bucks a month for you and me, we could be eating champagne and steak every day. Every day. <laughs> wow. But people cannot get it into their heads that heaven forbid I don't buy organic so and so or non GMO this or whatever. You buy what you can afford. And I get criticized all the time. Tara, you're just too harsh. Yes, I am. Because people have got to wake up. You've got to wake up. If you're going to be dealing with inflation, if you're going to be dealing with what is possibly World War III, if you're going to be dealing with the government seizing all your money for a protest, if you're going to be dealing with yet another supply chain issue or another lockdown for no reason, you are going to have to wake up and make some changes. It boils down to that. And you've got to stop whining and figure out what you're going to do. Okay. Is that good enough for the show today? <laughs> no, well, but seriously. Well, one thing that I, I mean, we've, she and Tara and I have lived with less, but not nearly as much less as she lived with growing up. But one thing I did notice on food, it, well, first of all, if you're if you're right on your budget, like if you're spending every dime that you make at work, you probably need to be reevaluating the things that you're spending money on, because no matter what your level of income, you need to figure out a way to make your expenses less, or else you will always be in a desperate situation in crisis mode all the time. And one thing I would say on food is mostly what we've heard from people. Seriously, I actually have seen this in our comments on the show. Oh, oh man, inflation is so terrible. Steak and shrimp is really expensive these days. Or they actually say that. New England clams. Or, and I'm thinking, okay, What but, are you doing buying steak? Well, I, I think it's fine if you want to buy steak, if you have the money and you're feeling fine about it. But if you're coming saying, I'm, so, I'm in such a desperate situation because the economy is really tough, I can't buy a luxury item. <laughs> Like, well, it's not really a catastrophe for you yet if, if you can still buy the luxury items. I'm not saying that we should just say, oh, wow, inflation, we don't care, because it's, it's something that is a problem and needs to be resolved. But if you can't resolve it, it's good for you to focus on the things you can. Because I've noticed, I told Tara this back in 2008 when everybody was talking about the big catastrophe then, but we still see it now and inflation is higher, is... Um, you know, the Starbucks in our town, the drive through line goes all the way it's around the store. never empty. And out onto the street. And Literally, there is no less than 10 to 15 cars every when, single time. Wendy's, every day, the line is all the way down and out, out onto every the street time. and blocking traffic. And I'm thinking if, if, yes, it's a concern that there's inflation and the people who, like, it's good to share your opinion with the people who are who are your representatives who are able to change that but the thing is for you personally I, I i'm thinking when i see those things i realize individual people are maybe not even though their budgets are they're spending more than would really be desirable the fact that people can still do that says that your situation isn't dire because we when we were in a more dire financial situation we never ever ate out anywhere and uh, like we didn't I, have date night. We couldn't afford a babysitter. We never did any of that stuff for more than 20 years. 
We and never had date night because we couldn't afford a babysitter. And some of that time, we would have been able to come up with some money to do something, but we were realizing that we were trying to get ourselves in a better situation so that we didn't have to complain about how bad our situation was. And we just chose to do something less expensive. Uh, and so, even now, like in our town, eating out is more expensive than it was in Colorado. <laughs> and a lot of people that we know go out a lot. And we almost never do <laughs> because even though we could, we could afford to spend more than we used to, but we almost never do because we think it doesn't seem worth spending half of a week's groceries. What is it even a whole week's groceries yeah. on eating out once? Yeah. You know? Okay. So start putting your questions in because we're going <clears> to <throat> start answering those in just a minute. But I just wanted to say, Debbie said, I bought her cookbook. Her grocery bill went from $700 a month down to $350 for free people. And they're eating better homemade meals. That is awesome, Debbie. That's great. But you know, as we're sitting here talking, I, and I'm trying to find the comments, but I can't. Um, there are people that are like, well, I'm only going to buy organic. I'm only going to buy high quality foods. Listen, when the fecal matter hits the oscillation unit, all of that is going out the window. First of all, it's all going to be organic because we're not going to have fertilizer or fertilize the foods. But you are going, I, I totally get it. I'm gluten-free. I'm dairy-free. I'm on a very restricted diet. I totally get that. But my grocery bill has not gone up because of that. Even with my gluten-free, dairy-free, highly restricted diet, my grocery bill has not gone up. Why? Because when steak is $12 a pound, I don't buy steak. I don't buy shrimp. I don't buy chicken if it goes over $2 a pound. Now maybe $2.25 a pound. I won't pay, pay more than that for chicken. I don't pay more than $2 a pound for pork. Why? I just don't eat those things and I choose to eat the cheaper meats the cheaper vegetables. I'm not going to go out and buy an artichoke that's $3 versus carrots that's 50 cents to a dollar for the same amount of weight. I would say on the, the organic and the GMO and those things, it's fine if you want to eat that way. It's fine if you feel a um, internally that there's some benefit to you for doing that. But it's still a choice that you have, that you are exercising that choice to spend it. And if you can afford it, great. The main thing is, if you've ever been desperately poor. Like, that's the, okay, that's you, the problem. If you've ever been. 90% of America has not been desperately poor. So that's the problem. So that's why people can't get this. So there's nothing wrong. I mean, personally, I think it's kind of a scam, but. Nevertheless, if you if if you think it's important for you to buy that, go ahead and do it when you can. What Tara is saying is a lot of people are expressing concern over inflation, like I'm going to suddenly not be able to buy things I want, and there is a real possibility that that, that can happen. But as long as you have the choice to buy those kinds of things, you're not in a dire situation. And so it's fine that you, if you have the money, go ahead and do it. But if you're going into debt to spend, to buy things like that, because you think that there's a big difference, then it might be useful yeah. to re-examine that. Um, because when, when things are really desperate, I'm not saying that, like Tara is saying that she thinks that things are going to be a lot more desperate. I don't know. Right now they're not. Uh, I mean, it's uncomfortable in some degrees if you have to pay more for something, but it's not desperate at the moment for most people. But a lot of that stuff, it is it is a choice you have. Like when you really get to be practically homeless or homeless, then you have to decide, okay, what's the absolute most important thing so I don't die? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not, we're not saying everybody's there or that you're going to be there anytime soon necessarily, but just 
it's good to reassess your priorities and think when you're saying, because like Tara is saying, it, it really bothers her when people kind of complain about how terrible things are economically and then say, I can't afford my luxury items. Yeah. All right. Poll questions for me. Oh, thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Barbara. Um, she used her Amazon points to send us some Belgian chocolate. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All for free. Okay. So I had a question. Did my brother and I work when we were growing up to help pay for expenses? Yes. I started working when I was 14 in a flower shop and I paid for my car and clothes and stuff like that. So yes, I did work with that. Do you have any other questions pulled? So, well, this is a tough one. And we didn't talk about cars yet either, did we? Not yet. Sandy's saying shopping for a cheap used car, not taking on payments, $4,000 budget. Any recommendations on good used cars? So cars have gone up <clears> 40%. <throat> and that was one thing on our list that we haven't touched on yet. But used cars have gone up 40%. And yes, I have been watching for two years <laughs> because we have been down to basically one car for two years. And so I've kind of been watching. And yes, it's very difficult. We prefer Toyotas because they are easy to maintain. They keep going well. You know, they don't have a lot of breakdowns. All of the Toyotas that we've ever bought have been a really good car, but you are going to spend a little bit more now on a Toyota. So are you pulling but, questions? But the one thing about that is, in our opinion, the amount of maintenance we've had to do on the Toyotas we've had <laughs> has been low enough that I would pay more for it if I could possibly get the yeah. money. Yeah, because the not, amount, borrow, not borrowing the money. Yeah, we had would, a Ford, had a Buick, and those just, they just like ate them up with repairs, and we just have never had that problem with Toyotas. Yeah, I mean, and one thing we found is if you spend the, if you spend the absolute lowest possible, then there will probably be more repairs. And it, so we kind of tried to find a sweet spot in the middle, which lot when we bought our car that we're driving now was three thousand dollars although with inflation since then it probably would be four or four five hundred for that car yeah um but nevertheless that it would be worth it to do that to get a car that's less likely to have problems yeah okay um there's some questions if you can pull those while i'm answering this one um what is our grocery budget so right now we spend about four hundred dollars a month just on our regular groceries i don't count my extra stockpile in my regular grocery bill because I had built that up, got rid of 75% of it. By the way, I'm going to be doing a video on that for those of you who've asked. And so I got rid of 75% of it. So I'm building back up. So I don't count my stockpile in that, but I could, if I wanted to, I'm just trying to increase my stockpile quicker than what I normally would do on just, you know, like my $5 a week, which you guys, Go to Living on a Dime, search $5 stockpile. We have a free ebook on how to stockpile for $5 a week. But we have the money right now, so I'm stockpiling more now. So I keep that separate for our um, budget, yeah. All yeah. right, next question. Um, so we're answering questions all over the place, even though you haven't talked That's about That's fine, yeah. Yet. Okay. Uh, KB, a couple people were asking about heirloom. Josephine said, which seeds do you buy? You said you don't buy heirloom seeds. And KB said, is it better to have seeds that are hybrid or heirloom for well, saving seeds? Okay, so I, I didn't, if I said I don't buy heirloom seeds, that's not what I meant. I do buy heirloom seeds. I was just trying to explain the difference. So heirloom seeds are old fashioned seeds that haven't been bred to be disease resistant and that kind of thing. You want heirloom seeds, you want heirloom seeds to grow the plants if you want to save the seeds for the next year. But I would also buy some hybrid seeds because you want to mix a few in with your heirlooms because if a disease comes through your tomatoes and wipes out all your tomatoes, you want to have some disease resistant varieties so that you will have some seeds later. You don't want to just be dependent on one type of tomato, heirloom tomato. And so that's why I get both hybrid and heirloom. I like the heirlooms because I like the different varieties and I like the different colors and that kind of thing. I'm a huge gardener, was working on gardening videos today, actually. But I get both and I would recommend 
both so that you can save some seeds later, but you still have a crop if a disease comes through. Um, <clears throat> Isis, should we be saving or throwing extra to the mortgage? I would pay, well, I mean, saving saving cash or paying off your mortgage. I mean, I would get your mortgage paid off. I would be as debt free as you can. I would save enough to be able to like repair your car. Yeah, or buy a new car. Pay your house for yeah. several months if you were to lose your job or whatever. But I would I would definitely dump everything. I would start there. with $1,000 and then <clears> I would have $10,000 saved so that you can replace your car if you need to. But then after that, I would be dumping everything you can to get your debt paid off. Oh, by the way, earlier some people said if they want to, if they want organic food, then they they grow it themselves, and you can do that if you're yeah. into organic and you don't want to spend money on stuff. I'm not into organic, but most of my gardening is organic, just because I'm good at gardening and I don't have to worry about spraying anything. And so and I'm not saying that not being good at garden. I know somebody's going to comment. <laughs> I know I just use alternate methods first, like dish soap and water, before I will use pesticides to see if that will get rid of the aphids and that kind of thing. If it doesn't, then I will use a pesticide. But most of my gardening is organic just because I've done it for so long. I mean, I've been gardening for more, probably 35 years now. Yeah, about 35 years now. And so I kind of have gardening down and that's what I went to school for. I went to school for greenhouse management and landscape design. So it's crazy that I'm a cookbook author, 25% off right now. Do you see how I worked that, <laughs> that in there? Really nice. <laughs> Smooth. It just went right in like, <laughs> like. <clears throat> so it's kind of funny that I'm a cookbook author because I actually am a gardener first. And so, um, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, you can grow organically very easily, so I wouldn't let that worry too much. Um, um, shipping to Canada is pretty expensive. We don't ship to Canada Oh, we're not anymore. shipping there now. Okay. Sorry, we can't ship outside of the USA anymore. Oh, anywhere out of the US? Nope. Ooh, you didn't... can thank your governments for that. So, so I need to change that. I'm really sorry. You already did. No, not to the, only to certain countries that you've mentioned. Okay. Well, so because of the European Union and the United Kingdom's um, VAT taxes, we can't ship there. Canada, we're having issues with the systems there. So we just have had to say, we do, no, we're not shipping outside the US anymore. So go ahead and uh, get the ebook though. We have ebooks available for all of you guys to do that. What you said about um, the VAT tax, it's because they want us to maintain a bureaucracy here to account for all the destinations that we send things to everywhere mm -hmm. in their countries. And it's difficult enough for us to do that in the I was going to say, we're US. having a hard enough time. We're having to hire someone in the U.S. to manage it because it's too much. The bureaucracy mm -hmm. that they've mandated is, is beyond what our business can do. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. In, next question. Um, S. Clarkson, do you have a set budget for decorations and gnomes and stuff? <laughs> no. So we have a little secret about our budget. Okay, so hold on. So like the decorations for the tree and stuff like that that I do change every month, almost all of that is from the thrift stores. And like this tree, I spent probably five dollars on it if that much and so i mean i wouldn't call it a set budget but i don't spend um i don't spend a lot either so uh the gnomes i get gnomes for my birthday that's my birthday presents then and christmas presents that i asked for and viewers have been sending them too and viewers send them to me because um, i love gnomes they're so cute it's funny though right now <clears throat> we don't really keep a traditional budget in the sense that we we have spent, we've been thoughtful about the money for so long that we don't uh, we don't really lay it out on paper like a lot of people want to do. And even when we were in a lower income, we still didn't do it that much because basically Tara was really good at shopping low, and I was good at calculating all the bank balances and stuff. And so we 
uh, we just didn't spend a lot of money on things. Yeah. So, but as far as the gnomes and stuff, uh, we could probably spend a little more on it now than we used to. And Mike got me a bunch for Christmas. So yeah. I got my, I had to get rid of a whole bunch when we moved because they needed a bunch of work or got broke or whatever. And so it was really me. sad. And well, also, thank you for replenishing them. You're welcome. Um, but there are also, I used, used to be a Christmas that it, I would get Tara different kinds of snack treats or whatever, and she can't eat anything now. <laughs> So, like, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I have gotten in the past as little small to medium-ish gifts for Christmas that I can't. And so it's kind of gotten to be where if gnomes are available, they're uh, yeah. better Have option. I seen the gnomes at Dollar Tree? No. I guess I better make a trip over there to the Dollar Twenty Five Tree. <laughs> I have not seen that. Um, any idea when the undated planners will be out? Yes. The so here's our 2022 planner. You can still get it. We said yesterday was the last date because we thought the undated ones were going to be today. Sorry, but if you still want a 2022 planner, you can grab it. Go to Living on a Dime to the store or to the shop. Um, but the undated planners are almost done. We're like we're like this close to having it done. So I'm hoping next week. I hope. Um, we are super close to getting the undated planner. Uh, Brenda, can you share the design for the homemade Berkey water filtration system? Um, yeah, let me run over real quick to this great channel called Living on a Dime. And it is right here. And this video is going crazy. Here you go. I just put it in the link for you there. Um, Kathy wants to know, do you have any advice for chipmunks in the garden? Oh, that's awful. So pretty much what you have to do is just fence off all of your plants really well. So you have to get the small, oops, right there, not there. You have to get the really small fencing. I don't know if they, I don't know if they can chew through the plastic fencing, but you might have to get metal chicken wire or something like that. You're gonna have to make sure all your bottoms are sealed. You're gonna have to make sure it's up high that they can't climb anything. You'll probably have to close it on the top because sometimes they can climb up over. Chipmunks are a pain in the patootie. I totally get it, um, but that's probably the best that you're gonna have to do. We have really big. Uh... We have really big chipmunks here, so. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, do we, uh, Renee wants to know, do we include tithing in our budget? So yeah. <clears throat> we do tithe first, uh, but. We tithe 10%. And yes, that is a New Testament thing also for all of you who are gonna argue with me about it. Well, a minimum <laughs> of 10% we do. Yeah. Um, but. I, I think we mentioned this just now, even though people ask about budgets, we do have a certain amount that we spend and we stay within that amount, but we don't formally lay out a budget. We really haven't ever because Tara's just not into, she's not very into like- <laughs> I don't the, budget. The planner has been brilliant for her, but she's not really into lists and budgeting and mm -hmm. uh, tracking things that way. That's kind of more my department. So as far as budget, she's just, because they had such desperately low income when she was younger, spend. she just doesn't spend any money. Mm -hmm. And I will sometimes go spend money. Sometimes if there's something that she won't spend money on, but I think, wow, you know, she would really like it. I'll go get it for her because I will spend it. <laughs> but in general, but I also have learned, I used to spend too much and I've learned to not do that. So, yeah. so between us, we don't really keep a budget, but we do tithe at the, at the first, and here's why I don't budget. We did a whole video on this. Um, but the reason why I don't budget is because I don't think that budgeting is actually something people should really do. Because here's my thing. You can say, oh, I'm going to spend $500 a month on groceries. And so instead of trying to spend the very least amount that you can, you spend $500 a month. Well, but you could maybe get your grocery bill down to $300 a month. But you think you have to spend $500 because it's in the budget. Well, that's ridiculous. And so I don't think that's, you know, anything you should do. I put the link in there for you guys just now. Um, 
on that video if you want to watch more about that. Ouch. Barb says, get a dog to deal with the chipmunks. <laughs> or a cat. That'll do it. Yeah. Actually, it's interesting because when we were in Texas, um, when I was growing up in Texas, we realized that cats keep, for the most part, keep snakes away. Yeah. <laughs> um, grasshoppers. Oh, man, that's a bad one in the garden, too. You'll just have to cover everything with netting like you do for birds. The really fine netting is what you would have to do. My great grandparents had to deal with grasshoppers in the Depression and the Dust Bowl. And they have horror stories of them eating the paint off the tractors because it was green. And wow. it was absolutely awful. And guys, that's the kind of thing that's coming. The Bible tells us these things are coming. And so it's going to be happening soon, one way or the other. But God is setting these things up and we can see it happening right before our eyes. Those of us who are Christians and who have read Bible prophecy and can see the signs of these things happening, it is going to happen. And so that's partly what that's part of the reason why we do some of these so that you can be prepared for when if you think that thing going around for the last two years was a pestilence that the Bible was talking about, you got news coming. That was nothing. That was absolutely nothing. Go back and look at the Black Plague. Go back and look at the Spanish flu. That was a true demic. You know, I'm just saying. And so the thing is, we have just gotten so, such to be such weenies about everything that we can't handle any kind of catastrophe that comes along. And so getting prepared for these things and bucking up, it's going to really help you when it actually happens. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned that because I think about stress, a lot of people talking about stress, like I think people are more stressed than ever for less reason than ever. And it's because now we have information, we're able to get things easily. Social media is actually by design, designed to make you feel like you're the center of the universe. Like they actually, their system is designed to do that, to keep you there all the time. And because of that, we feel like we have control over everything and that things should always be safe. And that's just not realistic. And it's so, not. so recognizing that things aren't safe and trying to minimize your risk while also getting out there and doing awesome things in your life. That's important. Yeah. Uh, I lost who asked it, but somebody said, where do you get cheap house paint? I get it at home Depot. Um, they have it. The, when people go in and it's a mismix, it's like $5 a gallon or something like that. And so I get it at Home Depot. We used to, when we lived in Wichita, they had a um, hazardous waste recycling center. And so mom would get all of her paint from there for free. They just gave it away. When people turned it in, turned it in, they would just put it on the shelf if it was still good and let someone else take it. And so um, that is um, another way to do that. If you have a friend who's in construction or anything like that, ask them if they have leftovers, um, that type of thing. Uh, okay. Let's see. Um, Marie said grasshopper soup possibly in the next cookbook. <laughs> Ugh. After hearing my great grandma's stories about that, I like, just take me now, Jesus. I remember like, oh. having survival training in the Boy Scouts. And I remember uh, one of our friends demonstrating eating a grasshopper. And I was thinking, yeah, I'd have to get pretty hungry yeah. <laughs> before I do that. I mean, I won't say I would never do it, but yeah. I'd have to be pretty awfully hungry. Uh, do you guys have any tips on how to get a house on SSI? What lenders to go to? Most won't accept me because you're too low. Sometimes your income is just too low and you won't be able to. So, I mean, you may have to get another job to supplement yourself or something like that. But honestly, there are some situations where you just don't qualify because your income's too low. So, well, one thing about that, though, depending on how great, how good you are at saving within your SSI. Yeah. If you could come up with some amount of cash, uh, then you would have to borrow less. And so you might be able to qualify for that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's. Although, if ever you were 
getting a house mortgage and the bank tells you, oh, you can afford up to this much. Um, what the bank tells you is always more than you can really afford. <laughs> so keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah. Okay. So I know I'm hitting the nail on the head when they're saying I'm condescending and superior, dear. I think we have hit the nail on the head. You are the type of people we're talking about. It's up to you to make the decision to improve your life or not, no matter what your situation. I lived on $300 a month. It really stunk when I was on my own, but I kept working myself up in the situation. Yes, you can pick up and move. I did pick up and move when I was living on $300 a month, several times actually. And also- It's a choice. And you just have to make the choice on where you're gonna spend your money and how you're going to do it. Also, the about we don't all have family we can depend on for help. We we were we had fa we had no family that would get that we 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 may have had family that would give us money, but we never asked. <laughs> and um, we had very little family to help with other things. Jill was very helpful, uh, particularly with the kids or with Tara when she was really sick and I was out of town working. But in general, we didn't have any of those things either, but we still made it work. And, and actually what's really funny is if you're saying that about us, then either you don't know us very well or you're making an excuse to stay where you are in life. Because we were very desperately poor. We had no refrigerator. We had we ate we ate meat that the cat we ate had meat eaten. that a cat a wild I mean somebody else's cat had attacked. We did all these things because we were desperately poor. And the reason we're not now is not because we got lucky, we hit the jackpot or whatever. It's because we figured out how to improvise. We figured out how to live, how to make do, how to make do without things that we didn't have and to live on really nothing. I mean, we were almost living on nothing. And then when our income went up a little bit, we didn't increase our spending to match that. And instead, we used that money to get ourselves into a better situation. And that's the thing that people don't a lot of times people don't want to do is cut back on things and, and feel like People in America make it sound like you're suffering if you don't have what other people have. What we realized is if we do without something now, then we can get ourselves into a situation where we're no longer desperately poor and right on the bottom. And we still drive a 22 year old car. Why? And it's the only car we have. Because, well, we have a pickup, but we don't use that for driving because it's got issues. But it's not really drivable at the moment. <laughs> but so we have one 22 year old car that we use to drive. Why? Because I ain't about to go spend 40 or $50,000 on a car unless I can pay cash for it. And it's a conscious decision that I make. So making excuses is not going to go over here. I'm sorry. I have been through it. I have lived through it all. So there's not a scenario. Well, the only thing I haven't lived through is being a widow, but I can handle that if it happens. No offense, dear. Because <laughs> before I had to do all of that, I had to survive on my own on $300 a month. And I did it quite well for a couple of years until I got married. Yeah. And then when I got married, I made sure I married well. And I didn't marry a jerk. What? Say that again. And I didn't marry a lazy bum. Oh, say that again. And I married someone who helped out. So that then I didn't turn around and have a divorce where I'm having to fight thousands of dollars of custody and that kind of thing. And I know it's not always possible, but, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm getting on this. But... I have a lot of friends who have been in that situation with a jerk of a husband. And I had one friend and she told me, she said, yeah, well, he slammed me up against the wall as we were getting ready to walk down the aisle and tried to choke me. 
As they were getting ready to walk down the aisle, he slammed her up against the wall and threatened her as they were getting ready to walk down the aisle. And yet she married him. What is wrong with you? Stop it. If a guy treats you that way, stop dating him. Move if he's <clears throat> stalking you. Get a restraining order, whatever you have to do. But these women say, oh, well, he was never like that way before. I got news for you. I know of one person, of all the people that I know that are divorced, I know of one person that didn't have some sort of sign beforehand that their husband wasn't a jerk. Well, and so, yes, a lot of this is preventable with the choices you make. And it's actually, it goes both ways. The same thing can happen with guys. <laughs> exactly. The main thing is people, people feel like, I don't know, nobody, I'm not, nobody's paying attention to me. Here's a person who's paying attention to me and it's really nice. But then sometimes I, I tell the kids this because it's like sometimes something will kind of slap you a little bit. I mean, not figuratively slap you in the face about the person where you realize, whoa, I don't know about that. And then you, you're like, but they're paying attention to me and it's exciting to go out with them. And I'm going to try to, I'm going to keep going out with them. And then after you get used to that, then another thing happens. It's kind of like the whole frog boiling in the pot thing. And so it's always useful along the way to try to imagine if a friend told you a story of being in a situation like you're in, would you advise them to continue that relationship? Because a lot of times I think I was also, it's funny because we were watching a Hallmark, some Hallmark movies over the holidays and there were these, you know, Hallmark's always got the the girl who's got a boyfriend who's a schmuck, but she thinks he's the, she kind of is almost desperately following him. And then there's another guy who she kind of butts heads with and eventually realizes he's actually a nice guy and her boyfriend's a schmuck. But the thing is, I told, said to Tara, man, it's hard for me to buy it because in these movies, I, I can't believe when women would put up with that from a guy. And then Tara was saying, but they do, but a lot of women do. And it's, you're not respecting yourself enough if you, if you do that. What's funny is before we got married, one time I, I was, we were upset about something and I yelled at you. Like I yelled at her one time. How well did that go over there? And she's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> This cannot happen. <laughs> I'm really reconsidering everything that we're, we've got going on here because this cannot happen. <laughs> like she was super firm about this is my boundary. You can't yell at me. I don't allow it. And I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. And I, I mean, that was kind of still a little bit of the old me there. But I realized right away, oh yeah, this is not okay. And, and I think that it, People need to make those things. Unfortunately, if you're if you've already been through a situation, whether or not you could see it coming, you know, it's difficult now. No, but a lot of people tell me stories, and I know there are situations. Somebody said their husband comes back from deployment and they're a totally different person. I am not talking about that. I know there are brain injuries, I know there's PTSD from certain things. That is not what I'm talking about. But the majority of people Whoa, wait, who what? are in that situation. I don't know what it is about me, but I I have people who have been abused gravitate towards me. <laughs> it's like every friend I've ever had has been abused in one shape or form, you know, um, at least personally, personal, you know, friends in person that I know. I have several online friends that, you know, that aren't, but it's like every single one of them have been abused in one way, shape or form. There is a reason why God says, do not have sex before you're married. Because it clouds your thinking. Oh man, all brain functions go off at that point. Yeah. It's not because God is trying to be a killjoy and ruin your life. The reason why he has the Ten Commandments is to help us, not to hurt us. 
You know, there are Christians, people who say they're Christians and they're living together and they're not married. You cannot expect God to bless that. You cannot be a Christian and not tithe and expect God to bless you. These are put in place to help us not to be a killjoy. And it's because when you're doing these things, it clouds your mind. It clouds your decision making. And then you end up in this mess over here. Yep. No, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing with you. Actually, it's interesting because uh, what it, uh, there was something. Um, oh, somebody said that. Oh, I'll have to look for it because it was interesting. It was well said, and actually, that's kind of uh, a life lesson thing. If I can find it. Oh, oh what? she. She said something about oh getting it that after her divorce, she did some basically rethinking about things. And now she's, now she's happy. And I, and I can't remember, I don't want to put what you said out of context, but uh, since I can't find the comment, it was along, I think the message was, I realized I had made some mistakes with this probably in fighting in the person that I chose. <laughs> and now I've learned from that. Uh, hopefully I didn't mischaracterize what you said, but um, that's it's useful in life to always recognize that you don't wanna make huge mistakes if you can avoid them, but some mistakes are inevitable. And if you learn from those mistakes, then that's that, that will make you a better person in the end. Yeah. Yeah. So and you learn from your mistakes, but what I'm saying is, you know, well, I would, well getting involved with somebody and getting married to them who is going to slam you against the wall on your way to the wedding, obviously that's you're asking for trouble because to it's one thing to realize that that guy did that to you. It's another thing to then still go and say yes. Yeah. Because then you're saying yes. You did that to me, and I understand that's the standard in our lives. Yeah. And it's not. You should say, no, this is not the standard in our lives. I I would say if you're in the church and you're at the altar, <laughs> like, there's still time to say no if the guy's being a jerk to you mm -hmm. <laughs> or girl. <laughs> so. Well, and, you know, and this is part of the problem with the church nowadays. You know, I was watching a thing on the Southern Baptist Convention, and let me tell you. If you go to a church that still belongs to the Southern Baptist Convention, you need to find another one because they have totally gone down the toilet. And I was watching some of these things and they were like, you know, all are accepted at our church. Yes, everyone is accepted to come into the church and hear the gospel. But if people who are living together and not married, people are living and doing things with the same gender are and people who are um, treating their spouses badly. If all of these types of people are in leadership or in programs or volunteering, if your church is allowing that kind of thing, you need to find another church because what's happened is we have gone from being so legalistic that you can't even play cards and you're a bad Christian if you play cards, even without gambling, to, oh, we must love everyone. Yes, we love everyone, but that does not mean that sin is acceptable and you can't expect God to bless sin. And we have noticed that that is a big problem with a majority of the churches now, is now they have gotten so weak on the other side going towards love. Yes, you're kind to people. Yes, you're respectful to people. But there are certain things that you do not allow to infiltrate the church. Why? Because it's for your own good and it will harm you and it will harm families and it will harm children. <clears throat> 
And that's why you do it. And that's why you listen to God on these things instead of just listening to yourself. And so I think that it just goes right back to the, the whole beginning is really, it's all about being self-absorbed, no self-control. You know, what does the Bible say? In the end times, there's going to be no self-control. Oh my goodness. Lovers of money, lovers of self. I mean, you just see it every single day. And I'm not saying that if you're married to someone who's a jerk that you can't work it out. But, you know, a lot of problems could be avoided if you would put God in the right place in your life instead of having another person or another thing in that place instead. Um, so there's a conversation going on here. Sean, I hate to rain on your parade, but you, if you say I don't believe a couple who are together for more than 20 years and raised children together as Christians are bad people because they weren't married. I'm not saying they're bad people, but what I'm saying is if you're saying there's nothing wrong with it, then you're calling God a liar. And you're not you're not a true Christian then. because yeah that's not well, because that's not what the Bible says. God says not to do that. So it's fine if you're not a Christian that you believe that that's fine. But if you are a Christian, you're calling God a liar. And some people some people are Christians, but they still do things like that because they really don't know, like they haven't read the Bible or something. But the thing <clears throat> is, if if God has said something to us in the Bible, and we say, I don't believe that, then you're saying that either you don't believe in God or that God is a liar. One yeah. of the two. Like there's no other place for that. And here's the verse right here. First Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, free from sexual immorality. That's <clears throat> all sexual immor immorality. And you all can say, it. and a lot of people will say, well, I don't think it's immoral because I'm committed to the person. You're not committed if you're not married. You can walk away at any second. And it's fine, like, in terms of whether you agree or not, you can make that choice. And everyone in America can make that choice in a lot of the world. But if you're saying God thinks it's okay, then he must be a liar because he said it's not. Yeah. So either you're not understanding or you, you're either you're not understanding or you've rejected that or whatever. But the thing is that God says that we should be married if we're going to have families. So uh, that's not me saying that. And again, I know people that aren't, and I'm still friends with them, and I don't criticize them. I don't go tell them, you know, all right. But if they were to ask me, what does God say? I can't say God some said something that he, that goes against what he said, because then I would be guilty before him of lying. So yeah, and his response was, "Yes, we are all sinners, no matter how Christian or religious we all are. Sin, and we have to ask God for forgiveness. That's not totally true. You ask for re for forgiveness and turn from your sin, and you repent from your sin. What does that mean? That means that if you are living together, you are sinning. Well, so then you turn from that, and you either leave that marriage, or I mean, leave that relationship, or get married." And that's in, that what, case, in that case, I would get married. And I would think yeah, if you're I would with get somebody married. for 20 years, why not? Um, but the thing is that when it, the Bible says repent, people don't understand. They think that means something scary. But all it means is I it means uh, decide in your heart to agree that God is right. And then turn away from the things that he says not to do. And it doesn't mean that we'll never sin. Like, I'm not saying you're never going to sin if you become a Christian. What I'm saying is if you sin and then you say, like, as Christians, we'll still sin. And then we'll realize, oh, man, I, that was wrong. And, and stop. And, but if you get to a point where there's something and you're doing it and you know it's that God says not to do it, but you do it anyway, then you're saying, I don't agree with God. So that's unrepentance. That's an unrepentant heart. So I'm not disagreeing with you that people can care about each other and that people can 
decide to be together and have kids together or whatever. But if you're together for 20 years and you have kids with somebody and you don't want to get married, there are really only reasons for that are I, you just don't want to be committed to that person. Um, and, well, and you just don't believe what the Bible says. Or you have fear you know? about something in your heart that you shouldn't be afraid of if you're a believer. Like if you're, if you're not a believer, you can be afraid of all sorts of things because there are no promises from God that apply to you. Uh, they only apply to believers. So, so what I would say is, I we're not saying you know, if you're, uh, we're not saying that if you have a differing opinion that that's wrong. We're just saying if you say that God says it's right, that's not right. <laughs> well, and why are you being judgmental of others? Why are some people judgmental? Of, that's not being judgmental. We're just telling you what the Bible says. God is the judge, not us. We're not judging you. We're just telling you what the Bible says. And the Bible is very specific. The only relationship you are to have sexually is between a husband and a wife of a different gender married. That's the only kind you're to have. Now, it doesn't mean people don't mess up. But when you're a Christian, you ask forgiveness and you repent by changing your ways. So if you're living together, then you need to either get married or leave that situation, you know, get counseling, whatever help you need. But it's the Bible that we are telling you. It's we're not judging. I'm not here to judge you. <clears throat> I'm just telling you what the Bible says. And the Bible's, you know. Well, no, I would just say the same thing is that, um, like I said, I have a lot of friends who live together with somebody and they're not married. I don't go tell them you're not supposed to do that. They're not asking me. It's not really my business to decide what they do in their lives. If they were to come to me and say, God says it's okay for me to do that. That's where I would, if they asked me, I mean, if they say that to somebody else, I'm not going to go get in, or get in the middle of their thing. But if they come to me and say that, I would then have to say, well, God doesn't say that you can decide to do that. And that's not really up to me. And I'm not going to judge you for that, but God tells us what he wants from us. <clears throat> and he's not doing, he's not telling us those things so that we, you know, to rain on our parade. He's telling us those things because he knows that we're hurting ourselves. And so if you, when you say the when not, not, I'm not talking to you, Sean, <clears throat> other people, when you say, you know, people, um, what was it, judging other people? I don't judge anyone. Uh, God will judge everyone, including me. And so it's important for us to have a relationship with him and recognize what he asks us to do and follow him. If you choose not to do that, that's totally up to you because God allows you to choose to do that. But God is still going to judge us all in the end. I'm not judging anyone because I have my own things that he's going to, you know, he's going to, well, I would say he's going to judge me on, but he's forgiven me of those things because I accepted him. <clears throat> so, um, so what I would say is if you think other people are judging you, maybe you need to have a heart to heart with God because it's really not other people. There are people who go around and they look at you and they just flag you down and find you somewhere and chase you down and say, you're a sinner, you're doing these things. We're not called to do that. God doesn't call us to do that. But he does call us to tell people if they ask us the truth. And sometimes that means we tell ourselves the truth when we really don't want to believe it because there are things that we maybe want to do and they're not good for us. And he tells us not to do them for that reason. And sometimes we do anyway. And he's forgiven that, but he will guide us back if we're believers to turn away from that. So anyway. Didn't <clears throat> okay. Um, so we've got several people. Um, have we come across anything in the Bible that you have found hard to believe or follow? Well, yeah, there's lots of things. But you either believe, in, believe what God says or you don't. 
I mean, it's hard to follow a lot of things and you're not going to be perfect. That's why we're all sinners. That's why Jesus died for well, us. If you're married to someone, I think we can both agree that sometimes it's, it's hard to, it's hard to be honoring that person all the time and treating them as if God would have you treat them because in our hearts, our hearts are, the Bible says our hearts are sinful and all of us are. And so there are things that are difficult like every day, like it's easy when you're dating somebody, you're thinking you're going to get married or when you're newlywed and you are newly married, it's easy to see rainbows every day. It's hard to, to do the, it's hard to, to do the things about that that aren't as easy as you go. It's hard to take care of somebody when they're sick. It's hard to, you know, go out of your way to do things for people. Um, biblically, yeah, there are a lot of things that the Bible asks us to do that are difficult. Although what I have found is the longer I'm a believer, the more God has changed my heart to where some of those things I don't, I don't have as much trouble with them anymore. And there is... <clears throat> If you're a believer and you don't, and there are things that you're like, I just don't know what I think about that. Take heart, <laughs> because I do. I would say that over the years, I've gotten to where I realized that we, if we believe it, we really have to believe it, and we can we can kind of try to hold back on things that we don't want to let go of. But God will, if you're a really believer, God will work on you on those things and make it intolerable for you constantly <laughs> until you give in to him on that. And I found over the years, the things that I had difficulty doing the most have slowly kind of faded. But there are always going to be things that we're going to have struggles with doing. So... Um. Linda says, I don't believe that God cares about the piece of paper from the local courthouse, but he cares <clears> about how you honor the promise you made to one another and to love and commit one another. Okay, I would say if you're on a deserted island and you're the only two people on there, okay, maybe. But that's not the case. In our societies today, as it has been for the last thousands of years, 2,000 years, marriage is a ceremony between a man and a woman saying they're committing to living to each other until one or the other of them dies. Yep. Period. <clears throat> well, I mean, you can make whatever excuses you want, but that's what it is. Well, so. there should be an official permanent connection there, which is to say a paper from the courthouse. I would stand in front of a pastor <laughs> and make those promises before God, but obviously the government it says go get a marriage license that's fine um but in some sort of way should be actually getting married <clears throat> so um yeah actually i've seen a couple of good things people said here edward we're justified by christ and as christians we need to be sanctified in christ and he says live god's way there's blessings so yeah, that's one thing we've talked in the past that uh, the Bible says if you uh, to be saved or to be a Christian that you have to be born again, and it says that to do that you have to believe that Jesus came as a, that you are sinful, <laughs> that we are all sinful, that we've all sinned against God, and the penalty for that is death, and that Jesus came and did not sin at all because He's God and He paid the price for sin, our sin but that we have to accept that as a gift from him. And if we do, that he will then uh, cover us with his righteousness. So at that point, God will not judge us for our sin. <clears throat> does it mean that we can keep, does it mean that our sins in the future will also be forgiven? Yes. Does it mean that we can just decide we're just gonna sin willy nilly? No, <laughs> it doesn't mean that at all. Um, and when he's talking about, um, sanctification when you are when you come to that place where you believe and you repent you agree with god that your sin was wrong and you turn away from that um and you follow him that uh, he will put his spirit in you and then his spirit will lead you to a renewing and a changing and a cleaning basically 
And so that sanctification is that he's conforming you to the likeness of Christ, the Bible says, making you more like Jesus. And you will never be as good as Jesus in this life, but um, he's making us more like himself. So that's what the sanctification is. And at that point, it is much, um, much easier to do those things that you really didn't want to do in the, in the beginning. In fact, I know when I came to Christ, I hesitated on that decision for a little while because I didn't want to give up some of the things I was doing in life. And I finally realized I just have to let go and let him lead me there. So um, does Mike have a job? <laughs> My job is being her manager. <laughs> I was going to use another one. I don't know. <laughs> just kidding. Yes, Mike works more than full time for living on a dime. He's the behind the scenes guy that makes me look good. Thank you. You're welcome. Appreciate it. You do look good. Wow. Oh, by the way, someone earlier was asking about your lipstick. What kind of lipstick is it? Uh, it's Maybelline. I think it's Lover by Maybelline. Um, it's the 16 hour long wearing stuff. I have to do long wearing stuff for the shows because otherwise it'll fall off. Um, if you don't have a Bible, livingonadime.com, click on the shop. We have Bibles for free if you cannot afford them. If you can't afford them, please buy them because we give away a lot of Bibles now. And so that just gives us more for people who cannot afford them. Um, but if you cannot afford them, use the coupon for the <clears throat> Bible. It's right there on the page. We only charge the cost of the Bible and the shipping. So if you cannot af afford it, then... Um, please use that coupon. Um, let's see. Are we um, going to have a greenhouse? This wait, oh. it's, it's not an urgent thing because I understand what you're saying, but um, somebody said uh, that Moses had two wives and God loved him. Moses because, did not have two wives. Yeah, Moses, Moses had one did. wife. Now David, David had sinned, a, Abraham. Yeah. Sinned. But just because things happened in the Bible does not mean that God condoned it. Well, and if you're sinning now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it does mean that God is calling you to something and you can choose to go with that or, or not. You can choose to accept him or reject him. You can choose to follow him or do your own thing separate from him. It doesn't mean he doesn't love you. Those people in the Bible, like David, like actually really almost all the giants of the Bible had like terrifying sins they did. And, and I think part of that is uh, us being able to look at that and see uh, how God forgave them and changed them. Some people, I'm not really sure, like Solomon, he was... God gave him all this wisdom and and he gave him a lot more than he asked for because he was so wise, but Solomon kind of became a train wreck at the end. So I don't understand that. But nevertheless, God, God loved all those people and loves you, but he didn't always love what they did. And fact, that doesn't mean that God condoned it. God used those examples to show how sinning against God creates problems in your life and consequences in your life, but God can redeem you even through your sin. Well, and, and when you repent and, and change your ways. Right. And even though he loved those people, like for instance, King David, uh, the Bible says he's a man after God's own heart. God held him up as an example of a, of a guy that's close to God. And he did amazing things and followed God. And then he sinned in a huge way with Bathsheba and uh, basically took another guy's wife for himself and had the other, had her husband killed so he could, you know, not have to be guilty before God of his sin. And God brought him, uh, God brought his sin to light. And then, even though God forgave him, his life sort of became a train wreck after that, where he ended up and having he had the consequences for his sin. His son tried to overthrow him as the king. Tried to kill they him. got into battle. <laughs> his son ended up dying in the course. His son that he conceived with the lady that he lusted after 
he also died because of his sin. So God loved him, but there were consequences. Mm -hmm. And and I assume based on what the Bible says that David would have gone to heaven. But um, nevertheless, he lived a pretty tragic life after that mm -hmm. because of the decisions he made. So God loves you. And if you come to him and are saved, then you'll be with him. But nevertheless, if you continue in certain sins that he says you shouldn't do, I'm not saying I, I say you shouldn't do because, well, I'm saying you should follow God. But I, it's not up to me to decide what you do. It's, it's between you and God. But if we decide that God is not right and we're going to do our own thing, he will let us suffer the consequences for that. Mm -hmm. And if we reject him, the consequence for that is eternal suffering and hell. Well, and we don't get to heaven by being good. You're not, you <clears> don't <throat> get to heaven by being a good person. A good person is not going to get to heaven. A person who does good things is not going to get to heaven. The only way you can get to heaven is to admit that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died for your sins Confess your sins and ask him to be your savior. That's it. It's called grace. It's a free gift that you don't have to pay for. Good people don't have to work to get into heaven. If you're doing things to work your way into heaven, that's not the free gift that Jesus has promised us. And all you have to do is ask for the free gift and he will give it to you. Um, because the Bible says, we're all sinners. Well, the Bible says when you do that truly, that you're born again and he has created you as a new person. And after that, some people believe that God saved us by his grace, but then now we have to stay good enough. And that that's not what the you're Bible never says. Gonna be good the Bible enough. says we cannot be good enough. Only it's only through him. And there's no way we can even maintain our salvation once we have it because we're going to sin again tomorrow, even today. And that's enough. If we if we had to perform, we would never be able to do that. And that's why it's such an amazing miracle and blessing that he did that for us. Yeah. So um, what version of the Bible do we recommend? For for ease of reading, I like the New Living Translation. Hmm? Yeah. Oh. Uh, for ease of reading, I like the New Living Translation. It's accurate. Actually, I'm amazed at some, a lot of people say it's not accurate. Um, but they're wrong. <laughs> but it's it's a thought for thought translation, so it's not word for word. Uh, but it is very accurate on what it says. So there are two kinds of translations: word for word, where the words are exactly word for word, and thought for thought is where uh, it translates what the meaning of this was, but the words they use to tell it are different. Um, like if you say, "I," um, you're going to slap your mama. <laughs> <laughs> That's the literal words. This is so good, you're going to slap your mama. But we understand that to mean this is really, tasty. really amazingly good. This is the best cheesecake ever. So a thought for thought translation would translate that as um, this is the best cheesecake ever. You're really going to love it. Okay, but just give them a the word for the word Bible. translation would say you're going to slap your mama. So. Uh, New Living Translation is the one that I like the absolute most. It's easy to read. It's accurate. If I want to know word for word, I like New American Standard Version. Mm -hmm. uh, English Standard Version is really good. New King James is really good. NIV, I think it's fine, even though some people don't like it. But I've done a lot of study, and it's great. King James Version, Old King James, is great. But if you can't understand it, then get another But version. most people can't understand yeah. that because we just don't speak 17th century English. Um, so it's a good translation, but it's just hard to understand. There are others that are really good um, and a few that are not. But I would say if you go to BibleGateway.com, and if the translation is there, it should be a good translation. Mm -hmm. Everything I've seen from them has been good. Yeah. <clears throat> um, somebody asked if I'm having a greenhouse this year. So we were just talking yesterday about trying to get a greenhouse built. But Looks like it's going to be five hundred to maybe a thousand dollars to build it, so we weren't quite sure if we wanted to do that yet because we have new products coming out, like our undated planner and our recipe binders that we're working on right now. So we're trying to put all our money into those. So we're on the fence about the greenhouse. We're trying to decide about that. 
By the way, I know some people watch from France. If you're in France, the Parole de Vie version is really good. <laughs> I have one. <laughs> so. Um, okay, let's see. Any other questions here? Actually, Evie says NLT is too different from all the verses I've memorized at some point or hear all the time. That's true. If there's a Bible that um, mm -hmm. you've memorized a certain way and it's comforting to you that the verses are the way that you remember them, as long as it's an accurate translation, fine. a lot of people want to stick with one that they're familiar with because, you know, as a kid, they memorize tons and tons of verses mm -hmm. in that. And that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. So, um, and you do not need another Bible to translate the Bible or you don't need another book to translate the Bible. You um, don't need anyone to pray over you to go to heaven. It's only a relationship between you and God through Jesus dying on the cross. And it's a free gift. So that's the only way. You can go straight way. to God because of what Jesus yeah. did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you doing a recipe flip book? We are doing an <clears throat> empty recipe binder for people to print off our recipes on our website to make their own recipe book is what we are doing. Yep. And I'm hoping to have that out before Mother's Day. I don't know. We'll see. My designer is having um, some medical issues coming up, so I'm not too sure about that. Um, what is my favorite vegetable to grow? Tomatoes. I love tomatoes. I love radishes, turnips, lettuce. Well, I've never, I love lettuce, but I've never grown good lettuce. I need to figure out a good, good solution for lettuce. Um, so I like a lot of the vegetables, peppers. So, um, Mike, are you doing your channel anymore? Okay. So I am still planning to do the channel. I have been procrastinating on it because believe it or not, it was taking me like 20 or 25 hours to make one of those. And we're trying to put together a studio now. And uh, I'm just trying to figure out a way, I have some ideas of how to do it, but a way to make it take only like three to five hours for me to make one of those videos. And that's pretty much what the delay has been. So we're working on right now, kind of uh, trying to get the studio thing together so that it's more of a plug and play. So I really have been having a desire to do it lately, uh, but that's been the delay. So hopefully soon. I'm sorry I keep yeah. saying that and I haven't so far, but. We've got a lot going on right now, <clears throat> so. But I have found a way that I haven't tested it yet, but I think if I if I do it, it, it's kind of along the lines of what we're trying to do to help Tara also be able to get things done more efficiently. And um, if it works, then I would be able to produce them yep. at a more reasonable time. Faith and veggies, Tara's, how's your new eating plan going? I'm on the low FODMAT diet and it's helped a bit in my case. So I'm on low FODMAP too right now. Um, it's helping with some things, but not others. It's not helping as much as I was hoping it would, um, but I'm still on it. So um, what year did we first do YouTube? The first year we did it was 2007. <clears throat> we said, this is a pain in the butt. Nobody's watching. Why are we wasting all our time doing this? And then in 2016 or tw about 2014, we came back doing uh, frequent videos in 2016. We went live. Heather, very good question. If you can't understand what scripture means, is looking up its context no different from getting guidance from a pastor, minister, or priest? Okay, that's a great question. And it is okay to, uh, first of all, if you continue to read it all and study it God will and pray, God will reveal to you things through that scripture. Um, but it's also helpful to look up uh to find places that you know are reliable and look things up and try to understand. And if you don't know if they're reliable, then look at a lot of different sources. Um, but I would pray about it to see, you'd have to have some discernment. You can't just take what somebody says as, as true without checking it. Um, pastor, minister, priest. There's absolutely nothing wrong with going to a pastor or a minister or a priest or whatever and saying, what do you think about this in the Bible? Or what do you think that God is saying here and asking them? But the Bible says that we should check everything, look in the Bible and see if we like pray about it and look in the Bible and see if we agree. Because it's people can always tell you their opinion, but even pastors and priests are incorrect a lot of the time. And so 
the Bible specifically talks about a group of people called the Bereans. I know I've mentioned this before for those of you who have been around a lot. Um, and they checked everything that Paul told them. And he praised them for that because they went through the scripture to see if it was really true. And that's really important that we should do that. So it's totally fine to go talk to people and ask for counsel from people that you think you can trust. But you also have to be aware that some of the people, even the people that believe what the Bible says make mistakes. Some people don't believe what the Bible says, but they portray themselves as that they do. So you have to be able to check by looking in the Bible and seeing what God said to you before. And you have to be a little careful too, because people will say something about the Bible and they'll point to a verse, but one verse does not necessarily mean what they say it means. Like you can read the one verse by itself and it might appear to say something, but if you read the whole Bible in context, or at least that book of the Bible in context, it says something different sometimes than what people are telling you. So yes, it's fine to get if you have no idea. Uh, if you have no idea, what I would mostly recommend is praying about it and reading it more. Um, but if you have to ask people, then you would want to kind of think about what they say and ask God if it's true and read the Bible. Because sometimes you, you can ask God if it's true, but it, you may get an answer that's not from God. <laughs> so um, there's something else I was going to say. What we were saying, though, about that is the Bible says that there is no, um, there's nobody that we have to go to as a conduit to speak to God, that Christ is that mediator for us. So, so if, you don't have to confess your sins to anyone but God. You don't have to, yeah, you don't have to, a lot of people kind of in the in their minds are, I'm not really good enough to approach God, so I have to talk to somebody else who's then going to plead to God on my behalf. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the Bible says. God said, the Bible says Jesus is that person. And so you, you can go talk to somebody else for guidance, but you don't have to feel like you have to go through them to get to God, because that's the whole reason why Christ died. Yeah. So um, why don't we wear wedding rings? Because I don't because I'm too fat at the moment. So <laughs> I have mine still. So for me, it looks like the one ring. <laughs> so for me, why I don't wear mine is I'm on wedding ring number like six or seven now <laughs> because I lost it. I threw it away. I've smashed it with a four by four. And I started doing some more things and it was really irritating me. And I just didn't want to smash my finger again with the wedding ring on. So really we're married, but you don't go around winking at, winking at women since you don't have your wedding No, but you know, everybody I know. So you probably hear about it. Oh, and Pamela says, if what the Bible says is true, it's true. If what the Bible says is true, if but if you don't believe the Bible is true, then there's no possible way you could be a Christian because it's it's God's word to us. <laughs> and so if you don't believe the Bible is true, but you say you're a Christian, then you're just sort of making up your own religion and calling it Christian. Because yeah. then you're just having to decide for yourself for and that's a different story. Like if you don't believe, if you're not sure that the Bible is true, that's sort of, you're going to have to approach God and pray about it and come to ask him to lead you in your, in your own heart to the truth. I mean, uh, unfortunately, people sometimes make mistakes when they do that, but that's, I ended up kind of, I ended up, having a faith crisis when I was a teenager because I didn't really believe what I was being told. And I walked away completely and um, questioned all of that and made a lot of mistakes and chased a lot of things I shouldn't have chased. And then God got a hold of me and kind of slapped me around a little bit. And then I realized who he was and then he led me on a path to him. So if you don't, if you're not sure about if the Bible is true, there are ways you can research it. Like, there's all kinds of, the Bible is the one book that has a massive amount of historical evidence and pretty much everything, well, everything that it's predicted um, has happened except some things that are, they're still waiting for. 
and it's the only book in the world that has done that. So um, there are ways in mentally to do that, but the reality is, I mean, you can look at the facts, but a lot of people, even in the face of the facts, won't believe that. So there's a certain heart place you have to come to with God for that. And mm -hmm. that's, yeah. yeah. Um, what does it mean to test the spirits? Um, well, first of all, I, I, it means that if... I'm trying to remember the verse, but I think... If it's telling you to do something that goes contradictory to God's word... Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's testing the spirits. So let's say that you're being told that, yes, you're supposed to leave your husband. Oh, you're supposed to leave your husband. Oh, yeah, he's just a jerk. Well, if he's not having a, an affair, you're supposed to stay married. Now, you can get separated, but um, the Bible is not going to go against or the spirits. So those voices that you hear, whatever you want to call it, it's not going to go against what the Bible says to do. And actually, in context, it tells us that clearly. First John four. So if you don't, if you hear a verse that somebody says, and you're wondering about that verse, you can go to Google and type in some of what you've heard and and the word verse, and there will be all kinds of places that refer to that verse. So that's a good way if you're needing to zoom in on one quick. Uh, and then, so then also Bible Gateway is a good place to look. So I just went in there and typed in 1 John 4. <clears throat> and it says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So basically, when I was saying pray to God and ask him, testing the spirits is what the Bible is basically saying. You can hear, like Tara said, you can hear somebody say, you know, uh, your husband's a schmuck, you should leave him <laughs> and go marry this other person that you that you think you like more. And that's that's inconsistent with what God says in the Even Bible. Even if that other person is a Christian. And so that goes against God's word. So that's not. So the God. testing the spirits is saying, if you think you, if you've prayed and you think God is impressing something on your heart, you're supposed to, to, to find out to, to do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. So it's just to say, um, looking at what you already know is true, like the Bible is true. Um, and that's why we talk about the Bible. It's the word of God. If you don't... That's why you need to read if it. If you don't believe the Bible, the Bible is what tells us what Christians mm -hmm. believe. So um, so if you read the Bible and you understand the Bible and then somebody says something or you get an inspiration of something and it contradicts the Bible, then um, then you know that it's not from God. Mm -hmm. so you can ask God it's kind of like I love to say if you absolutely have no idea but you know you're lost and you don't know what to do and you're trying to figure out I actually said at one point okay Lord I don't know who you are but I'm willing to have you tell me tell me well I wasn't really willing to do anything he said or believe I wanted still God to be what I wanted him to be <laughs> So I, but there was a point where I was so broken because of everything I had done. I was actually willing to just listen. And at that point he revealed himself to me. So that's, um, that's really great. But just because there are times where I was saying that and I decided I want God to be something else and he'll let you go down that path if you want. So testing the spirits is looking to see if this message is really from him. Yeah, and read the Bible. Reading the Bible is the way. Do I mean, a search on whatever it is. Go to Bible Gateway or go to Open Bible. Um, let's see. It's openbible.info is really good. You can type in a subject and they will bring up all the Bible verses. It's really good. And if you, you can also go to Google 
which will lead you to open Bible and other places. And you can say uh, verses about divorce or verses about anxiety or verses about whatever. Um, and th there are people that have just gathered up verses and you can then look through those verses and read in context what it says in mm -hmm. each of the books. And you can get a pretty good picture of what the Bible says about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. You still need to read the whole Bible to really understand everything. But um, but if you're wondering about a certain topic, that's a good way to kind of to see what the Bible says individually about a lot of those mm -hmm. things. Um, and is it okay to interpret the Bible with your own, it just in your own way? No, not really. You interpret the Bible for what it says. I mean, you read it and what it says. And what I, I mean, there are some things that are parables and that kind of thing, but you know, I take the Bible literally first. And then if something just still doesn't really make sense, then I go in and I look at context and that type of thing. So, you know, look, look at it literally in context first and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to you. He will. You know, God... God's not good. He's not secret. He's not trying to hide something from you. He's not trying to be mystical or mysterious. He has it all right there so that you can see it all right there. Yeah. Um, Leah is asking if, if she, she, this is how I know without a doubt that Christ is truly convicting my heart. And the reason I find myself struggling is because the devil's trying to win me back. Yes. No matter, there are things that we know that he's con, he's kind of convicted us in our heart that this isn't right and we should change that in our lives. But we're there are things that we maybe don't want to give up, and but we know he's right. Um, in those circumstances, there that's a place where the devil will attack you more. Places where, like. Um, I shouldn't say this publicly because <laughs> then people know, but uh, like, because there was abuse in my family because I was abused. Um, I tend to, um, I tend to seek approval on things. And there are times where I realize, wow, this is wrong. Like God is telling me in this circumstance, I, I, should not be looking at what those people think. I need to be looking at what he thinks about me. But when I'm kind of run down and beat up in life, then that's where the devil will strike me. Like, well, you know, these people might not like you if you don't do that or so-and-so, or what's going to happen if you tell them you're, you can't be involved in this thing or you can't, you know, help out with whatever or meet for coffee or whatever. Um, so each one of us has our own place where the devil knows that we're weak and he will try to attack us there. And um, sometimes it's, it's, it's really difficult because he knows that's the place that we're, you know, wounded. So, uh, so yes, that's <clears throat> true. Thoughts on the Book of Mormon, another testament of Jesus Christ. Would you ever read it just for fun? It doesn't replace the Bible, just more scripture from God. So it's not more scripture from God. I'm sorry, but it's not. It's a scripture from man. It is not inspired by God. So my thoughts on the Book of Mormon is that it is not another testament of Jesus Christ. The only testament is the Holy Bible, period. And that's all you should be reading is the Holy Bible. And, you know, some people will say, oh, you know, it's the same Jesus Christ. No, it's not the same Jesus Christ. Um, it's totally different. And so... Well, and the, so first of all, I, I just want to say we have Mormon friends and we greatly and we respect love them. them and love them. Yeah, we totally love them. So it, obviously we would disagree on this, but the Bible says that Jesus is God who always existed from before forever and ever in the past and was not created. Um, but, uh, but the Mormon scripture says that um, Jesus was God who was born to uh, God, the father and Mary 
but uh, through them actually having relations as opposed to God just existing, Jesus just existing as God. So that's the thing that even though we look at the Bible and um, Mormon LDS people will look at the Bible and we will see stories that Jesus did this and Jesus did that, that's fine. But other scriptures that they have would contradict the fact that Jesus is God and has always been God and was not created. Yeah, they so, say that Jesus is a brother to Satan, and that's not so scriptural. That's, so again, we have the greatest respect for our Mormon friends, our LDS friends, and, and I definitely appreciate their passion um, for, for doing good works, but the Bible says our works are filthy rags before God, that we can't do anything to save ourselves. And th they're... The friends that we have, they they do some amazing things, and they have a really good heart. It's just that if you're looking at, at Jesus and you're not recognizing he is the one and only God from before everything was made and was not created, then you have a different view of who Jesus is than we do. So, and re respectfully, I would say it, I think that's a mistake, but again, we love our friends and and all. But we would not. I wouldn't. I would read it. Um, I wouldn't have read it in the past when I didn't know the Bible very well, because then I I think I would have been confused as to which part is the Bible and which part is the. I, but I would read it now, um, just to have context, you know if ever some discussion came up and we needed to talk about it. Um, so I'm, I'm not opposed to that. It's just, um, I think recognizing that there are actually contradictions um, from the, the Bible, what the Bible meaning is because it's been sort of reinterpreted. So, so Hard question, but it's really hard when you've when you've been raised and told something, and it, it's really difficult to ask: Is what I believe true? Read and the Bible. The I, Bible will tell you the truth. I actually did that. <laughs> it was a little easier for me because I didn't really have the family support and the support of lots of people who love me to try to keep me where I was. Um, you know, with my best being, with my best interest in mind, but nevertheless. Um, so I, I came to a place where I walked away from what I had understood. And I'm not saying that you should walk away from what you understand, but I, I realized there's a place where I had to find out, like, who is God really? Like, what is the thing to me? What is he? If I follow him without any idea of who he is, who is he? And that's where he led me. Is, is to recognizing the Bible is the word of God. It's the only word of God. And the, the thing that's really, the thing that I would find discouraging for my, my friends who don't believe that is that if you believe you have to work to be good enough for God, you're, you're hurting yourself. Because the Bible says, None of us are good enough for God. None of us can be good enough for God. None of us can ever do enough. But he sent Jesus to pay that price for us so that we don't have to do that. And once we are saved, once we accept him, once we believe and repent of our sins and accept him, he, he promises that he will change us and then we will do good works as a result. But we don't have to, to do good works to to gain his favor. Like he loved us when we hated him. The Bible says when we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So that's the main, the, it, a lot of people believe that they have to, in all sorts of faiths, believe that they have to struggle to be good enough for God. And, and what God did for us, the reason it's good news is because when we were absolutely utterly unable to do anything for ourselves. He did it for us. Yeah. Um, somebody said, aren't 
Mormons, the one that believe that you can become a God. Yes, they do. And so that's one of the ways Mormons, LDS, differ from evangelical Christianity. Um, and Debbie says, just like the Catholic who pay to all the saints. Yes, you can't pray to a saint. There's nothing that needs to intercede between you and God, just Jesus. That's it. And again, I grew up Catholic. I have great respect for Catholic people. But one thing I realized is we cannot work enough to be good enough for God. That's why he did it for us for free. Mm -hmm. And um, for the saints, I understand. I was, I was, I grew up in the church and I remember saying, I don't worship the saints or the statues or whatever. And that's fine. But I've come to think that the way the Bible is describing things to us, particularly when angels are telling people, you know, don't pray to me, don't bow to me, only, wor only worship God, mm -hmm. that seems to be indicating that praying and kneeling and giving that kind of respect and honor to someone other than God is inconsistent with what God would want from us. Because if the angels are saying, oh, don't worship me, don't get on your knees, don't pray to me, <laughs> then I think that's a sort of a serious message that we need to pay attention mm -hmm. to. So again, with great respect. We're not to pray to anyone I, but yeah. Jesus. And um, it's interesting because I somebody last week said a lot of Jewish people won't change, uh, won't, sorry, I was reading something while I said that. A lot of Jewish people won't, um, Somebody told me that on the show that they won't, her particular group of Jewish people won't uh, wear wedding rings and other sites of jewelry because they don't want it to be a, um, an idol before mm -hmm. God. So um, I know not all Jewish groups agree with each other on, on all those things, but ultimately what they do, I think, agree on if they're really Jewish is that nothing should be above God. Yep. Yeah. And Bill says there would have been no reason for Jesus to die if we could earn it. Actually, that that's is it in a nutshell. I have to say that that's a brilliant statement, Bill. And I, I have to say, when I was a teenager, one of my conflicts in the church was people would tell me um, Jesus died for our sins. And I would look up and I would see him on the crucifix, all beat up with a crown of thorns. And I would think as a middle schooler, I, it, it suddenly had this revelation like, okay, why did he have to suffer and die? I don't understand because if my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, what does that have to do with Jesus? And that was something that bugged me greatly for years. And um, I probably would have, I probably I think the main reason, though, I kind of walked away is because the people around me weren't modeling that, the the faith that they said they had. And I ended up kind of going in completely different directions, and God turned me from those directions pretty rapidly in a stunning way. <laughs> so, so Marie says, saints belong to the communion of saints. They are like friends who pray for us to help us. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that says that we're to pray to anyone except Jesus interceding for us. That's the only person we're to pray for. Well, again, with great respect, um, I would say when I read the Bible, it describes all born-again believers as saints, mm -hmm. not specifically people that have been designated um, for good works that they did. So, um, but like I said, I have great respect for my Catholic friends, and I would just say, read your Bible and see what it says to you. I understand um, everyone has traditions, but I've realized traditions in, don't get you into heaven. I've realized in my own life that the Bible is above our traditions, and so I try my best to to go to it a lot and see what God says to me directly. So um, I don't know if we want to answer this or not. I would like to know if Jesus was Jewish, then why aren't we? Well, because we are, <laughs> in a yeah, sense. We are adopted. Um, 
the Bible says that because God, we are all creations of God, we are not all children of God. The Bible says that God chose Israel as his special holy people. Um, and that um, they're an example in the Bible of how they're, unfortunately, <laughs> they have the distinction of being used as the example of how people just cannot stop sinning against God because every time he would lead them and wash them and clean them and work with them, they would still go back to sinning. And we all do that. And the whole message there was to bring Christ Jesus to the Messiah to come and pay the price for our sins because he's demonstrated to us in the old Testament that we are unable to, but in answer to the question more specifically, the Bible says that the, the Jewish people are still God's chosen people. They have not been replaced. Some theologies would say that they have. They have not. God still has a special purpose for them. But um, it says that because they have rejected the Messiah, Jesus, that he has also, well, he had a plan before that anyway, um, to accept anyone who would come. So it says that we are grafted into the tree. We are adopted as sons and daughters if we are born again. And Jesus um, specifically says that you should be born again in, in John 3. Uh, but there are other parts. I don't know where the verses are, but there are verses that say we've been grafted into the tree, the root of Jesse, um, and that we're adopted. Uh, John 1.12 says that uh, he adopts uh, to all who believe and receive him, he uh, gives the right to be called children of God. And so uh, in a sense, even though we're not Jewish, uh, we're in the family with Jewish people because God has adopted us. Like the Jewish people, he said, you are my children, but we are adopted into the family. So uh, incidentally, for those of you who are familiar with it, when Abraham looked up in the sky and God said, see all those stars, that's the number of your descendants. You, if you can count the, the sand on the seashore, that's the number of your descendants. If you are a born again believer, he was talking about you. And that I think is amazing. So um, yeah, so Jewish people are God's people. Many are not living for God, and he will deal with them at some point. Um, but he has made a way in the way as we, we come to Christ and recognize he, he has died for our sins because we couldn't do it for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did the Catholic Church believe in the Mark of the Beast? Do you remember that? Do you remember if they do or not? Honestly, we didn't get into... They didn't really do private prophecy in, in Catholic Church a lot, do they? Honestly, I would say we weren't super devout Catholics, so I can't speak for Catholic people fully. Um, what I can say is we had certain scriptures that we read on certain Francis weeks. Francis says, as a Catholic, we don't. Yeah. Certain weeks of the year, there were certain scriptures we always read because it was in the order of Mass. Um, there were many, many scriptures I had never heard before until I read the Bible later in life because I don't know if I don't know for like I said I can't speak for all Catholics but in my particular experience we were not encouraged to read the Bible we were told the Bible was the word of God uh, but mostly we read the scriptures that were in the order of mass on Sunday uh, and I don't recall ever hearing any prophetic things uh, there were a lot of things I didn't hear but again, I was younger and I, my family wasn't super devout, so uh, I can't totally speak <laughs> uh, for that. But I do, I do think that there's a general, um, the people that I knew, there was a general belief that kind of everyone's going to heaven eventually, but, the, but, the, but it mostly if you're really good, you'll go now. <laughs> And otherwise, God will punish you for a while. So somebody said the Catholic Bible doesn't have the book it of Revelation. It does have the book of Revelation. That? There is yeah, a book of Revelation in there. Um, and it reads the same. So if you're Catholic, you can read the book of Revelation just as much. Um, if you are Catholic, I would suggest if you don't 
regularly read your, and study your Bible, I would do it because it's the right. The apocryphal books, I don't believe, are actually scriptural. And for most of the Catholic tradition, the Catholic Church didn't think they were scriptural either. But they've a couple of times over history, they've been in there. And um, most recently, the apocryphal books have been in since the 1950s. Um, so I wouldn't put a lot of weight on them. You can still read them. I mean, there are things that are considered to be valuable. Like the Jewish people had things they considered to be valuable uh, for some sort of historical perspective or cultural understanding, but they recognize these are not actually the word of God. Like for instance, um, uh, the book of Enoch was quoted by a couple of uh, the first century church fathers like James, um, but the Jewish people didn't recognize it as actually scripture. They recognized it as an an important book that shared some useful information, but um, it wasn't considered to be doctrine. And so that's where you have to be careful. There are some things that might have some, mm, some interesting things, but they're just not to be relied on as the word of God. So, uh, hey, but I would just say, I would definitely read, I would read your Bible and just read it, it for yourself, read it and study it and pray. Yeah. And you can ask people, but the main thing is the Bible tells us, um, uh, like, but for instance, for by grace, we've been saved. It's not of yourselves. It's the gift of God so that no one can boast. It's saying we cannot do anything to save ourselves. Um, sometimes people would say, but then I look at James and it says faith without works is dead, which it does say. And the reason it says that is because if you are truly saved, if you truly have that faith, and that recognizing that you can't do it for yourself and Jesus is doing it for you and you follow him, then you will do good works because he puts his spirit in you and you are saved. It's not the other way around. You don't do the good works so that you can be saved. You are saved and then he prompts you to do the good works. So. Um, do you want to answer this one? I, um, I'm not an expert on Jehovah's Witnesses. I've spoken with a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses. They don't believe. Uh, they don't believe that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. They, which is not true. They're works based. They, their Bible has um, intentional of, mis. Yeah. They have their Bible has uh, things that have been intentionally mistranslated to confuse people. Um, they're they're very passionate. They. Um, they're very passionate and they have a love for God, but they're, uh, I, again, with great respect, <laughs> um, they, they discount that Jesus is God. And that is absolutely an unbreakable thing in the Bible. Jesus is God. Period. And, um, in, in John 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And in that, it's describing Jesus as Jesus is the Word. So it says he was God in the beginning. He was already God. He wasn't made at that point. Um, and it also says that he created, he was God through Christ, he created everything and nothing was created except through Christ. So they have, their Bible has, instead of the word was God, it, they have, it has been changed by their translators to the word was a God. And that's incorrect. So um, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure on this part, but I think they don't believe that Christ was resurrected. And they also have a belief, um, if I understand that, um, if we're if you're good, if you're good followers of God, that which doesn't include Jesus, then you are. Uh, Jesus is they they call Jesus the Son of God, who is a God but not God. But there's only one God. So I find confusion in that. I understand they have a way of sort of expressing that amongst themselves, but nevertheless, um, the, I forgot what I was going to say. Um, they do not believe in the Trinity. I don't That's believe. True. Yeah. They definitely don't believe in the Trinity. 
and they don't. They believe the earth is as good as it's going to get. They believe that, oh, I know what I was going to say. They believe that if you're good and you do enough good things for God, that you there are various levels of heaven. Uh, one of those is that you you live on a, again, I'm not Jehovah's Witness, so I'm not saying I'm 100% correct, but, but my understanding from what they told me is that they believe in levels of heaven where uh, most people will be good enough with God if they work hard enough to live on a more perfected earth. But that if you're um, extra good witness, then uh, there's another level yeah. that you would be at, which is a more perfect and they don't believe, yeah, and they don't believe in hell, and there is a heaven and a hell. And the period. And the thing is, if you don't believe in hell, what's the point of heaven? Then you, then Jesus was a liar. Yeah. Because Jesus spoke of hell yeah. a lot in the Bible. Yeah. Um, okay, so go ahead and add, address this one right here because I'm thinking maybe you should just address it again. Why? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. So maybe I will sort of say, um, yeah, I'm not sure what to say on that. Basically on the saints, uh, first of all, again, if, if you read the Bible, it describes saints as everyone who is a born-again believer, um, not a specific group of people that are elevated. <clears throat> In fact, Jesus says that we shouldn't be elevated, that the lowest of us among him, he will raise us up to. So, uh, but in terms of the saints, I appreciate, I appreciate that it's nice to have that but you don't have to go to them that um, it's kind of like praying to angels. If you pray to saints, like the angels have told us not to do that. And so I appreciate what you're saying there. And I appreciate that, that belief. I just think that it, it goes against what the Bible says. And that's where I have trouble. That's where I've had trouble. My own life struggles is things that I believed before. When I read the Bible, I realized, wow, it says this. It says I shouldn't do this. Or like Mary was an amazing woman, and she was specially chosen by God. But the Bible says she was a sinner, and she needed Christ as much as we do. Um, so, uh, and it also says we don't need to go to someone else to ask God for things or to tell him what we need. We can talk to him directly because of what Jesus did for us. So. Yeah. Ellie, our daughter's on here. Uh, Ellie. Oh, yep. <laughs> um, let's see. Isn't it God in three persons? Yes. God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit is called the Trinity. But the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity, but what the Bible says is there's only one God and that God is the Father or that the Father is God and that the Son is God and that Jesus or that the Spirit is God. And they're all 100% God all the time. And also that when Jesus was a man, he was all man and all God at the yeah. same time. And that's, we can't understand that because we can't, we, we, God is more complicated, complex than us. But because it says that there's only one God and that all that Jesus was God and the Father was God and the Spirit was God, all, all of them are God 100% of the time, mm -hmm. that um, that's where people have expressed that by using the word Trinity, meaning uh, three and one. So that's not a special like magical word or something the Bible says. It's just a way that people, it's a word that people have invented to describe what the Bible is saying about God. So. Stacy, it's okay. Everyone doesn't believe what you do and that's okay. Well, here's the thing. That's fine if that's what you choose to believe. But the Bible says there is heaven and there is hell. You're going to one or the other and it's your choice if you want to admit that you're a sinner 
believe that Jesus died for your sins and call upon the name of Jesus to save you and ask you to forgive you of your sins, then you're going to go to heaven. If you don't want to do that, then you're going to go to hell. The Bible is very specific about that. So, I mean, that's fine if you want to believe that God's not going to force you. God doesn't make you believe no, that. He's not going to force you to do that. He doesn't make you believe that. Um, but he does ask people to tell you, and then you have to decide for yourself what you believe. Um, and I guess my thinking, there's a time where I walked away from what I was told as a child uh, for a lot of reasons. A lot of it was because my life experience didn't seem to indicate that was true. Um, and I went all around a lot of places and tried to adopt a lot of things and God led me now to where I am. And um, I think everyone needs to um, have that experience in their lives. But the thing is, as far as God, a lot of people talk about God like like ice cream, you know, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Oh, you like strawberry? I like chocolate chip. Okay, that's fine with ice cream. Um, but what I came to realize with God is, if there is a God, he is what he is. He, We're not going to be able to change him. If he could create all this in some sort of way, which the Bible tells us is by speaking a word, um, if he can create all this, He's obviously a lot more powerful than me. So he has no obligation to change because of what I want him to be. And so I came to realize through my stumblings and trying to make God who I wanted him to be or whatever kind of God I wanted God to be so I could have my way. I finally realized I have to find out who it really is because he's not going to change for me. So like, for instance, when we were hiking, there were certain places where we'd be hiking on paths and I knew there was a big chasm there and down in the bottom of the chasm, there was water flowing through over a bunch of rocks. And I could ask people, Hey, which path is the right path? And they would say, you go up here and then you turn in this one spot and then you go along the edge and then you come down and there's a place to cross and you go up over the top. And I could have said, you know, I don't choose to believe that I'm just going to go on this path because it's the path I want to go on but it goes across the chasm where there's no bridge. And I have to then decide, do I want to do it my way? Or do I want to find out from the one who actually knows the path? So we can all choose. You're totally right. And I don't, you know, if people choose differently, God says that's okay. I mean, he doesn't say he, there will be judgment in the end from him, not from other people. Um, but he gives you that choice to make that choice. So um, I think it's important to really know who God is. And you don't have to believe just because we told you. It's good for you to go out for yourself and find out. But like I said, a lot of people treat God like ice cream. Like they just decide, I kind of like it the way these people do it. So I'm going to decide to be that. Well, my God is... <laughs> is the one who created everything. And I realize I have to do, I have to live life the way he designed me to live it, follow him, or else I'm just kind of a ship without a rudder. And so that's kind of how I came to where I am. There was a, it was a long process of him leading me there. And there were probably about three years where I realized he was actually leading me. Um, but even then I kind of wanted him to be the God that let me do anything I want. And that's what, took a little longer is to realize if there is really a God, I am not going to be able to dictate to him how he should be. He's going to have to tell me. And, and how did it go when you were doing what you wanted? Uh, well, he gave me a vision <laughs> of fire because I was getting into witchcraft and I realized, wow, that, that was a really bad thing. And it scared me, really scared me bad because I thought all those things were pretend. And when it happened, I gathered up the things that I had gathered to try to get into that. And I left my house and I went somewhere else to throw it all away because I was so terrified in that moment that I thought, I don't even want this where I am because I'm like, <laughs> and 
I knew God was telling me, this is not the way for you. And really, it's not the way for anyone. But in my life, he was dealing with me, not other people in that in that moment. So so I, I have a lot. I know for sure he led me to where I am. You have to figure out in your own life. You can't just trust me because I say it. You know, you, you need to figure out who God is. And so if you disagree with me, that's fine. <coughs> but I would still encourage you to seriously think, okay, I don't, like I did. Okay, if God is really God, then I can't change God. So who is God? See if you can figure out who God really is. Because like I said, the thing, my ice cream analogy was just to say, people treat God as a social club not really believing that this is God, more like this is a token I carry around because it makes me feel good. <laughs> and that's not it at all. A lot of times I don't feel good because God is teaching me something or leading me through something, mm -hmm. but I feel good later when I'm closer to him and, and it helps me endure things that are difficult, so. <laughs> okay. Hey, Adam. Uh, Criteria do you use to choose a church? Uh, they basically we we go we seek Bible believing churches, um, truly Bible believing churches, like churches that say that the Bible is the word of God. They preach salvation. It's the only book used. They preach salvation. So, like again, this is in the Bible, which is why. So, and salvation is, again, we're all sinners. We've all sinned against God. Um, we were unable to pay the price for our own sin, but, but we are against God because of that. And that he sent Jesus as the price for us because he loves us that much, that even when we were his enemies, he paid for our sins for us. So that even though we have sinned, we are we are presented to, to the father as righteous before God. So on the day when he judges everyone, even though we have sinned because of him, because of what he did for us um, and because we believed it and repented, which means we agreed with God that he's right and we're not, <laughs> then uh, we are saved. And so the church has to believe in salvation for us. Uh, it has to be, rooted in the Bible, not rooted in feelings or in um, whatever is popular in the culture, that sort of thing. So, And if a church has a woman as a pastor, that's very, that goes against everything in the Bible. If the church marries people that are of the same gender, that goes against the Bible. If a church um, allows things like people living together and they're okay with that before they're married, then um, then those types of things are totally against the Bible. Um, and so if it's in the Bible, but they're saying it's okay, as far as, you know, we, we are doing it out of love. Yes, we love those people and we care for those people, but you can't accept sin as something that's okay in the church. And so a lot of churches accept sin now, but that's totally unbiblical. Well, the thing is, the church has to follow God. And if the church follows God, then the church should follow the word of God because the word of God tells us the word of God is a love letter to us. It tells us what he wants us to know. And so if, if the church, I would go there, even if there are things that I'm doing that, um, that they tell me in, and, and it doesn't agree with what I think because the ideas get closer to God. And if you have, I like a lot of people say, well, what kind of church should I go to if I have this life situation or that life situation, or I believe this, I would say the same answer for everything because God isn't a, it's not a flavor of ice cream. God isn't a, let's go there to a church and hear what we want to hear. God is telling us what he wants us to know for our, our own benefit. And a lot of times it hurts because we want something different than what he tells us. And again, we're all sinners. 
And even if we're saved, we still sin. And that should help us to recognize, like earlier someone was sharing a struggle where uh, she uh, got, she felt convicted by God to, to get away from something in her life. And now she's being sort of tempted in that again. And she's wondering if that's the devil tempting her. Yes, the Bible says we have an enemy uh, who's like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We all have those temptations, um, but God has rescued us from that. And he forgives us if we sin. If Well, if we have come to him and believed and are saved, then all of our sins are forgiven, even the ones we haven't done. But because we are saved, he puts his spirit in us and we are, uh, he will make us less likely to sin as we go because he's conforming us to the likeness of his son. So who is perfect and never sinned. <laughs> so, um, so even if there's something that you're doing or you're involved in and you're like, man, I just don't know about this. I would still, I would still recommend a Bible believing church that really preaches salvation. I would not go, I would not go to a church that's hesitant to tell you what the Bible says because they don't want to hurt your feelings. But I would also not go to a church that um, is, some churches are very aggressive at um, coming to, a church needs to tell you the truth. So if the Bible says something is a sin, they need to tell you that that's true. But some churches like want to drag everybody out every Sunday and flog them and um, and tell them they need to be saved again and again and things like that. And that's all not true. So where if they follow the Bible, but they don't add to it and they also don't yeah. subtract from it, it's hard to find. It, it, but um, I would mainly say recognizing that um, you can look at a statement of faith on a lot of churches' websites, and they should recognize that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, like it is God's true word. It should say that um, that uh, Jesus came to pay the that we are sinners that we can't pay for our own sins that Jesus came to pay the price for us. It should say that there's a father and a son and a Holy spirit, and they're all one God, um, which we describe as a Trinity. But again, the Bible just says each one of them is all God all the time. Those kinds of things should be non-negotiable in the statement of faith. If you go to a church and it doesn't say those things, it's mostly just a club. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I put our Christian resources in there, guys, for anybody who's wondering, we put our favorite pastors that we know are sound Bible believing pastors online. I put those links in there for any of you guys who are um, wondering about that, because it's really hard to find a good Christian church nowadays. I mean, we lived in Colorado for six years and we went to one, but you know, it's wasn't, it still wasn't the best. And so we put some for online for those of you who don't have a church or you're looking for a church, watch some of these pastors and they, how they preach is what you should be looking for. Um, wow. Totally agree. Bob says, feel good church. Yeah. Churches that are, some churches just want to make you feel good. And the Bible condemns churches that, um, tell people what their itching ears want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then Cynthia says legalistic churches also are like the taskmaster, there's balance. And she's absolutely right. That's what I was saying too, is legalism or uh, Phariseeism is where um, it's kind of like the Pharisees in the Bible. They pursued people. They, some people call them sin sniffers. <laughs> they come to you looking for all the things that you're doing wrong. And mm -hmm. they're doing the same things, but they don't hold themselves to that standard. And that is not a, that if, if some people are like that, everywhere there are going to be people like that. But if the entire church is like that, not a good place to be. Yeah. Um, and legalistic churches, so legalistic means basically you're obsessed with the rules and you want to follow all the rules, but not necessarily obsessed with having a relationship with God who made you and wants you to have a relationship with him. Yeah. And um, those rules are important. But if you have that relationship with him, he leads you to that place. Mm -hmm. But you, if you follow the rules, but you don't have that relationship, you're not alive. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, thanks for the recommendation. Follow up question Is cohabitation itself a sin? I always thought cohabitation in and of itself wasn't a sin, but cohabitation plus premarital, you know what is sin, is what I think you're saying. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, I guess if you're roommates, I suppose, but that's really rare that people are living together and not doing things that married people should be doing only. Um, yeah. Um, although I would say um, a, it would be a sin to be living like you're married. Um, it, it would not be a sin to live in the same building, but um, it's difficult for guys and girls to live together in the same place if they have strong feelings for each other and try to hold themselves away from, um, you know, marital things, um, because that's the way we're designed. We're designed to want that relationship to be that way. And so it's creating a lot of temptation for yourself mm -hmm. that um, that's the problem is it's not a sin to live in the same place, but certain things can put you into the, the line of fire really. Like, because like, again, the Bible says the devil is a, you don't want to play with fire. The devil is your adversary whose mission is to try to dishonor God and destroy you. And so he's constantly working on your weak spots to try to chip away at you and get you with your guard down so he can get you to sin against God so that he can dishonor God. Basically, it's not really about you. He wants to destroy you. But uh, the problem is there are things where we can say, is it OK to do this? Um, like there, there are certain things that it's OK to do, but they're kind of closer to the line. and. When you get real close to the line, it's easy for him to push you over the line. And so um, the Bible says we should flee from those things uh, that are that the enemy can use as strongholds in us. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, what do you think of churches that test God's snake churches? The Bible says don't. <laughs> But uh, snake churches are where... The Bible says you shall not test the Lord your God. Yeah. And the Bible, what those churches are is they take the Bible story where Paul was bitten by... A, Paul, right? Paul was bitten, bitten by, by a, a snake. Yeah. yeah. He was on a shipwreck. And then the shipwreck, everybody washed the boat on the shore. And then a snake bit him right away. And everybody said he must be cursed because... God couldn't yeah. kill him with a shipwreck. So then God had him bitten by a snake. But then he didn't die. And there's a section in the Bible that um, is bracketed in the newer translations because it's not in most of the original texts. So it's probably not a reliable, mm -hmm. uh, but it says that section says uh, something about being able to um, hold snakes and not die or something. But people have taken that one verse, which is in a section of the Bible that's um, not certain it was actually supposed to be there that describes what happened to Paul in a specific circumstance and sort of they apply that to everyone as a test and that's wrong. Uh, yeah, I would not, that's, if a, if a church said that, I wouldn't go there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, it doesn't mean you can't, so aren't some snakes not poisonous? It's specifically referring to venomous poisonous. snakes, like the snake bit him and he should have died. But that doesn't mean that everyone can like play with rattlesnakes and they won't die. Yeah. <laughs> that's a completely misunderstanding. And by the way, yes, some snakes are not poisonous and, and that's fine. So do we believe in the Virgin Mary? Well, yeah. I mean, she was Christ's mother, but do we believe that she is someone that we go through? No. She's his mother who deserves a great amount of respect. Mother. Who deserves a great amount of respect, but uh, the, she's not a sinless person. Like yeah. she, she was chosen by God, and she was thankful. But we all need Jesus. Like all of us, the Bible says, all of us are sinners. Only Christ. He's the only one that was not a sinner, according to the Bible. Yeah. And that, um, but the thing is that we're not we're not supposed to like be beat up over that. Like Jesus. Um, came to pay that price for us. So 
the good news, the good news is that he paid that price for us and it's free. He took care of it for us already if we follow him. So if we believe in him and and repent, turn, agree that God is right and turn from our sins and accept him. Um, so, yeah. So as far as Mary goes, she needed him just as much as we do. So she's highly exalted among women. That's true. She's not sinless, according to the Bible. Yeah. Um, okay, so real quick, because there's an argument going on, and I'll just address it real quick, because <laughs> we're tired. <laughs> um, the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> um, so the argument is, if I, if I said women pastors are, women are not to be pastors in the church, and I take that literally, then I do I take head coverings literally also. So the Bible is very specific. Women are not to preach. <laughs> I'm waiting to see what the answer is. <laughs> well, there you go. Okay. So <laughs> here's the thing on the head coverings. First of all, the Bible is very specific about women pastors. It is strictly forbidden that women are to teach men in a church setting. It's fine to have women's Bible studies and things like that. But as far as the head covering goes, I have actually researched it. And when you go back to the Greek, there's one verse that says that, yes, you're to wear a veil. And you, when you're praying, well, you're supposed to pray without ceasing. So I would take that to mean that you're to have a head covering. But then another verse a little while down says that a woman's hair is her glory. So when you go back to look at the Greek for that, it can kind of be translated as her covering. Now, that is one of those things where I would say, if you feel convicted, then you should wear a head covering. But it's gray enough area that I wouldn't, you're not, I wouldn't say that you're not a Christian because of it, but I would say that pastors ordaining women as ministers, that is very strictly forbidden. And so we know that is a black and white area. And there are some places where, I mean, you can argue night and day over this, some of these things, but you know, some of that stuff, you have to get back to, we are sinners. What Jesus died for our sins, and the only way to heaven is to confess our sins and to accept him as our Lord and Savior. And then when that happens, the Holy Spirit will open your eyes to these things as you read them in the Bible, and you will know the truth. There are certain things that are absolutely not negotiable, like Christ came and lived a sinless life and died for our sins and that we, there's nothing we can do to pay the price for our own sins. <clears throat> and those things are not negotiable, but there are a lot of things in the Bible that it says that you have to determine in your own life, like, which do you believe about that? And if you disagree, if two people disagree on that, it doesn't mean that one or the other of them is not a believer. Um, so, some people will say major in the majors. It's kind of cliche, but, but but what they're saying though is certain things are absolutely not negotiable. And then other things um, are up to, they're disputed. So yes, there's a right answer, but we don't necessarily know for sure. <clears throat> and um, things like that, you kind of have, like Tara said, you have to determine in your own life, what is that? What do you think God is saying to you through that? Obviously, it says something, um, but it's kind of like, uh, I shouldn't bring this up, but um, uh, pre, pre-millennialism, what, no, what is it? Pre, Pre-trib, oh, pre, sorry, pre-trib, mid -trib sorry. Pre-tribulation, -trib. mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. You know, the Bible says a lot of things. Okay, but you got to explain what that is because some people don't know what yeah. that is. Yeah. Well, so from what the Bible says, there are three kind of major camps that believe at the end of time that uh, one of one of the groups believes the pre-tribulationists believe that uh, Jesus is going to come back and pull out all the church and 
uh, all the believers are going to be taken away all at once while they're alive, and that those um, that there will be seven years of tribulation. Some of that is God pouring out judgment on the nations for not following Him, and uh, after that there will be uh, an, an ending. I just won't go into all the details because there's a whole lot. Um, some people believe, oh, no, that's not true. There's not going to be seven years of tribulation. Everybody goes through that, and the church isn't being taken out, um, and, and we're all going to suffer together. And then some people have figured out somehow that they think that half of that we're going to be here, but half of that we're not. Well, ultimately, it doesn't determine whether you're saved or not, whether you're a believer. And so even though some people will die on that hill, <laughs> it's not worth fighting over that. So you can believe one or the other, and clearly one of them will end up being correct. But it's a little bit unclear because of various language that the Bible uses, um, which of those is the correct. So like we're, we believe that you will be raptured out and that there will be seven, if you're a believer, and then there will be seven years of tribulation where there will be apparently peace on the earth and um then the antichrist will come and um and during that time there will be a lot of tribulation which is uh, wrath poured out from god on the on the nations and after that he will come back with us um but others believe other things and there's a lot of scripture and basically people that believe one or the other who are really genuine will say yeah you know i could sort of see how they got that, but I think this is more plausible. Some things in the Bible are like that. You see them and you have to pray about it and read it and, and see what it's saying to you. Certain things um, are really not, if you don't believe them, then you've discounted the Bible. <laughs> so that's a long way of saying, I guess it's up to an individual woman to determine what she thinks that verse means to her. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. I, I, there are a few things like the tribulation. We firmly believe that we that Jesus is going to come in the clouds and take us up into heaven. And I know it sounds like alien craziness, but if you read Bible prophecy, all of the Bible prophecies, all the things that the Bible talks about in prophecy are coming true right before our eyes, literally right before our eyes. I mean, it's crazy. It talks about lawlessness. It talks about lovers of self, so love of money. Men sleeping with men, women sleeping with women, and not just taking a nap. And so you see all these things coming true. So whether the rapture happens, which we believe is going to happen at the beginning of the tribulation or the middle or the end, okay, yeah, I guess that could be up into to interpretation. I don't think it's up in, I don't think it's up to interpretation, but I could see how other people could get that out of it. Well, that doesn't mean you're not going to go to heaven. But when the Bible is really specific about something, sexual sin, the love of money is the root of all evil. We aren't to be doing certain things. We're not to have idols. We're not to murder. We're not to lust. We're not to have, we're not to steal. Those are very specific laws that God has put down. And so, I mean, I, I'm not against people wearing head coverings, but you have to also keep it in perspective. Like the Amish, people think the Amish are Christian. They're not. The Amish do not believe that the only way to salvation, the only way to heaven is through salvation in Jesus. They believe that you have to work your way to heaven by doing good things for other people and working with each other. And so, you know, it's the same thing. Just because you're Amish and you believe in Jesus, it doesn't mean that that's going to get you to heaven. Demons believe in Jesus. And they shudder. And they shudder and they flee. So just because someone says they believe in Jesus, it doesn't mean they're going to heaven. You have to accept that you are a sinner. You have to believe 
that Jesus died for your sins. And then you have to confess your sins and turn from them and repent and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. That's the only way to get to heaven. The Amish don't believe that. The Mormon Latter-day Saints don't believe that. The Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that. And, you know, I find it very interesting. People say, you know, well, why do you think that's the only way to heaven? Well, first of all, it's because the Bible said so. But secondly, why would all of these people who witnessed Jesus on this earth die a horrid death, going to their graves, being burned and chopped up in all kinds of horrible deaths? They, you wouldn't go to your death claiming that if you didn't believe it and actually witness the resurrection for yourself. Why is it that the name of Jesus is the only name that's a curse word? Joseph Smith, Smith isn't a curse word. Muhammad isn't a curse word. Buddha is not a curse word. None of those are curse words. Only the name of Jesus is a curse word. Because the enemy wants to dishonor God. Because Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. And he does that by convincing people that, oh, I'm going to go ahead and get a divorce and nobody's going to be hurt by it. Oh, I'm going to go ahead and shack up with my girlfriend and nobody's going to be hurt by it. Oh, I'm going to pray to the saints and nobody's going to be hurt by that because those are not true biblical teachings. It's just not. And I know we get a lot of people mad at us and that's fine. You don't have to listen to us. I do find it very interesting why a lot of people who don't agree with us keep listening. I go. I mean, I'm I'm good with it. I just find it hilarious how people sit there and say, "Oh, you know, I really like your shows, but but I just don't agree with this, or I don't agree with that." And yet, the people keep coming back, show after show after show. And you know why you're coming back? Because God is convicting you. That's why you keep coming back. And we don't do this. We don't do this because it's fun. Let me tell you. We do this because we love you and we want you to know the truth. And we want you to know that Jesus loved you enough that he died a horrid death on the cross for you. And I am not going to sit here for the little time that I have left on earth and lie to you. I'm going to tell you the truth. If we didn't tell you the truth, how could we say we cared about you? And let me tell you, if you guys think we're doing this for our good looks, good looks and charm, we're not. Well, you're not. I'm not. <laughs> well, I mean, you have good looks and charm. <laughs> That's not what you're doing. But God has given us this platform. And we are going to tell you the truth. Because we love you and we care for you. And quite frankly, I don't want you to burn in hell for eternity. Because there is a heaven and there is a hell. And it's awful. But it's your choice. God is not going to hogtie you and force you into heaven. You have to, you either believe in God or you don't. And it's your choice. And he loved you enough to give you that choice. So anyway, if you guys need a Bible, Michael, get the last few questions that we have. But if you guys need a Bible, we give away free Bibles. If you can afford one, please buy one because that gives us just more money to for the people who truly can't afford them. It's only $9.50. But if you cannot afford a Bible, we will give you one for free. Because we want you to know the truth. 
And I'll tell you, we have had Jehovah's Witnesses, we've had Mormons, we've had Catholics, we've had every denomination under the sun tell us, thank you so much for sending this Bible. It opened my eyes to what God was trying to tell me and I wouldn't listen. Yeah, and actually one of the reasons we, we like to send the Bible is because we, you need to see for yourself. You don't have to believe us. Yeah, you don't have to believe us. Just read it for yourself. Yeah. And ask God to reveal it to you. He's not going to keep it a secret from you. He's not a, a God that's some, you know, magical thing or some mysterious thing. He's not a God that you have to have someone interpret it for you. Yes, pastors do help interpret it so that it makes a little bit more sense. But go to the pastors that we put on here. We put these pastors specifically because they believe in the Bible only. And they preach it as it is. They don't add anything to it. They don't take away from it. Um, so yeah. So anyway, all right. Anything else, dear, you would like to address? Um, I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry too. <laughs> I haven't eaten since noon. <laughs> I have food that you know not of. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, aren't you spiritual? <laughs> so, yeah. So, guys, I mean, somebody said I had no idea about the Amish. Yeah, the Amish really is. The, the Amish faith is not a Christian faith. They call themselves Christians, but they're not. And a lot of people call themselves Christians, and they're not. And that is why the Bible says that. What's uh okay? I'm really not feeling good. But what's the verse on uh, you? You called me, and I never knew you. Um, <laughs> I never knew you verse. It's like the basis of our religion. Yeah, uh, the basis, they'll come but, to me and in that day I'll say I never knew you. Uh, yeah, the Bible says that at go the quick. day of judgment, there are going to be a lot of people that stand before God being judged and he's going to say i never knew you because they didn't follow jesus and that he is the only way that you are going to get to heaven is to believe that he died for your sins you cannot light a candle for someone you cannot pray over someone after they're dead you cannot baptize a baby and get them into heaven you cannot do good works you cannot have so many wives, so many children. You can't do wear certain clothes. None of that is going to get you into heaven. Yeah, Leah quoted it, but um, Matthew seven twenty one. Well, not everyone who says to me, "Lord, Lord," will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, "Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles?" Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Um, and later on, he says that the will of his father in heaven is to believe in the one he sent. Doesn't say to do good works. So just to be clear on that. So that's why I guess the thing is, God gives everyone the ability to choose what to believe for themselves. Um, so I would say if you disagree with us, uh, it's it's we're okay with that but i would encourage you to seek god and find out what he says to you about that and i would definitely read the bible uh and pray on that because and you know it's funny because when people talk about like if you tell somebody you're judging them bible says that we should tell people bible doesn't say that we should drag people into the kingdom so it's our, your our job is to tell you. And then if you disagree, that's between you and God. But having come through a lot of really crazy things before he, he grabbed me and brought me in, I would encourage you to make sure that you know what you believe is true. And um, like I said, he brought me through some pretty wild things and I greatly appreciate 
um, being adopted by him. So anyway, all right. Um, let's see, somebody said, I like listening to John MacArthur and Vody Bauckham. Yes, they are two very good preachers also. We don't have them on our list, but I should add them because I really like them really well. Um, so, uh, yes, Jay Brown, Adrian Rogers is great too. Adrian Rogers is really I haven't good. heard him for a long yeah. time. But he's really uh, good. Thank you, Mobile Notary, for the $20 Bible donation. Just for you guys to know, anyone who helps with the Bible donations, they go 100% straight to Bibles. Um, we actually spend more on Bibles than we get in donations. So just so you know, it goes 100% to Bibles. Um, that is um, really appreciated. Thank you so much, guys, for helping us because now we are in the tens of thousands of dollars in shipping out Bibles. So thank you very much for helping us with that. And we, we're we glad to do it. And God has blessed us. And you know what? We're just going to keep giving them out as long as he keeps providing the money for us to do that. And so, you know, we, we will. So Lizzie says the Amish don't occur, encourage to read the Bible either. There are people that left because they found Jesus. Yes. Uh, yeah. And so. Um, yeah. Somebody says here, nobody has to believe anything we say. Just read the Bible. Absolutely. I would yeah. totally agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do we think about Billy Graham? I know he's passed away, but I always loved watching his videos. I have never seen Billy Graham say anything that I disagree with. Have you? But no. I haven't watched very much of his sermons, so I don't know for sure. What I've heard, but... what I've heard from him, I totally agree with it. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen a lot. I think he, God uses different people for different purposes. <clears throat> and some people uh, explain in great detail finer points of scripture and others are encouragers and some are, he's in, he was an evangelist. So he was kind of like the, the front man, <laughs> like somebody who goes out and tells people, look, you know, God loves you. This is what he has for you. Do you want it? And um, that's a, kind of a specific job. Like it uh, gives us all different things to do. And um, to the degree that I understand what he said, I agree. Um, so yeah, for what yeah. it's worth. And Trisha asks, I love your family, but could, I think she means me, be seen as a female pastor at this point? No, I am not overseeing a church. The majority of our viewers, like 85% of our viewers are women. Um, but I am not overseeing a church. I am not overseeing men. And uh, for some who have seen in the past where Tara is saying things and I'm, I don't necessarily say something, um, despite the fact that I'm here, this has always been more of Tara's platform than mine. So a lot of times... Because 85 80, I think it's 85% of our viewers are women. Yeah, so um, it started out as exclusively her show. And now, even though we do the show together, it's Tara often is expressing her opinion on something. Um, and I don't always agree with everything that she says. What? <laughs> but um, sometimes, well, if, I, if it seems like we're getting into a whole lot of talking about the Bible, I'll tend to get more involved in that. Um, but the reality is when I don't say as much, it's, because she's sharing her opinion. Well, and, and sometimes you're dealing with comments and we get trolls and, I'm and stuff. I'm dealing with so. comments and it's primarily most, no offense intended to me, but most people, if I went off the show, they would still enjoy it for Tara. But if Tara went off the show, I would lose all the audience after a while. Maybe. <laughs> Much as everybody likes me, it's still more the Tara show than the Mike show. And so... Um, Tara is not being a pastor or a preacher. She's she's witnessing, <laughs> reaching people, sharing the good news and the message um, in the way that God enabled her to do that. But uh, the thing about women, and again, it's e easy to be for people to be legalistic in this area. Um, the thing about women is the Bible does say that. Um, well, Paul says I don't allow women to teach. 
people miss people will have all different kinds of opinions of what that means. Um, and our, I think kind of the way that we understand it is not to be uh, the, the supervisor over, no offense intended, but the supervisor over the men. And when I say no offense intended, what I mean by that is women are equal to men, just as valuable to God, but we all have a specific place. Kind of like I was talking about Billy Graham is an evangelist and somebody, I'm an encourager, other people or teachers, um, maybe I might have a little of that, I don't know. But everyone has a certain job, just like being in the army. Um, doesn't mean that someone's less than someone else, but... Uh, well, the Bible calls men to be the, Bible the calls head men of the to home be the leaders and, and women, women to submit. But men are called to love their wives as Christ. And the women are the still church. called to, to share the good news. Uh, it's just... Like I said, different people might interpret that differently, but the way I see it, it seems, and the way I think Tara sees it is, it seems to be saying that women should not be dominant over the men. Um, that doesn't mean like, if a guy's a schmuck, um, you, it doesn't mean you go out of your way. It, it means that the, the women should not be dominant over the men. It doesn't mean that women should be abused by men. <laughs> It's, it's often taken out of context and put in other places where it doesn't belong. Submitting to your husband doesn't mean you're a um, punching bag. Right. But it's Either like physically, emotionally or sexually. But it's mean. like, you know, if you're if you were if you're in the Air Force, you might be a pilot. You might be a navigator. Both are critical to the mission. But one of them makes the decision about where the plane goes. Mm -hmm. And. And well, I guess one of them steers the plane and the other one says, I think this is where I should go. I don't know. That was probably not the best example. But you know what I'm saying is um, it, it's not to say that women are less, just that women have a specific job. Women are created equal to men. It's just that men have their jobs and women have their jobs. And it doesn't mean that they always do them correctly because we're sinners. Yeah. But just like Mike wants to thump me upside the head some days and I want to thump him upside the head some days, doesn't mean you do it because you have Jesus living in you and you are called to forgive and love one another, right? Yes. <laughs> All righty. All right, guys, three and a half hours later, we love you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at a turret living on a dime.com. Please feel free to ask for a free Bible if you want it. But we pray for you guys. And we want you to know that you are, lo <coughs> you are loved. And you're loved by us, too. That's why we're still here. Yep. Because I wanted to quit today and I did it. I came on anyway. I was thinking it was funny after you, you telling me you were going to quit, like been going four and a half hours on the show, <laughs> three and a half hours, like three and a half hours. So somebody need to hear something and whoever you are, we're going to be praying for you. So have a good night. Live, visit us at livinganadime.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.